Sure. You're on. Let's take a look here. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Looks like a few people are still walking in, so let me just give a couple more minutes, inshallah, and we'll begin. Okay, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Ma ba'd. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, jazakallah khair to all of you. And welcome to our uh, Hajj seminar. Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing for me to at least be a small part of your journey, even though I do not have the opportunity this year to go perform Hajj myself, inshallah, you know, sometime in the future soon. Inshallah, I hope all of you have secured your packages. I know the system now has changed and it has gotten a bit more difficult, but I hope all of you are able to secure your packages and I hope inshallah and pray that everything goes well and smoothly from this point onwards and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to be invited to his home and to perform these great rites and rituals. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. So all I request from you, from my side, is to make du'a for me, my family, and du'a for our community in general, and of course du'a for the ummah. And also request to make du'a for my colleague and my classmate, Mufti Faraz. He is the one who actually prepared this entire uh, presentation, and you know he gave it to us to use for our congregations. So he is, mashallah, um, you know, one to share his beautiful work, but he, all, all he requests in return is for you all to make dua for him, especially when you go for hajj and you perform the hajj. So, alhamdulillah, you know, it is indeed a great blessing. Uh, first and foremost, for all of you, for everyone who's sitting today, is everyone here going for hajj, inshallah, this year? Everyone who is traveling? Not everyone? Mostly, alhamdulillah. So we have a few people who are not, which is alhamdulillah, that's good. It's still educational, inshallah. But for those who are going, mabruk to all of you again. Uh, I know the preparation for Hajj and the steps of Hajj in the beginning, it could be a bit intimidating and there's a lot of various rituals, various rites, and now with the new system, I know it's a little more difficult to secure, I guess, a muallim or someone who will be leading your group or someone that you know personally, someone that you may be comfortable with or you may not be comfortable with or what the system is now, I don't know myself, so when you come back, inshallah, I would like to hear from your side so that I am educated on this and you know we can whatever we can do to improve the system next year but alhamdulillah in addition to this uh, seminar to prepare for Hajj we will also have a WhatsApp group which is separate just for our Hajjaj who are going so that way inshallah if you are unable to receive any help while you are there while you are on the ground over there and you have any questions you are able to send questions at least on WhatsApp and then one of our scholars inshallah will try to assist as soon as we can and we'll try to answer your questions and to help you at least while we are here. So we'll, we'll try to provide that service as well. Anything we can do to serve our hujjaj, we'll be happy to do that. So as we prepare in this world for any large event or any big event, whatever it may be, hajj is one of the foundational aspects of our deen and the pillars of our deen. We know that salah we do on a daily basis, five times a day. Salm we do in the month of Ramadan. That is a one month thing. Although Salm is done throughout the year, 
uh, but it's nawafir. When you talk about ikhalat sawm, this is in the month of Ramadan. So that's only one month out of 12 months. Zakat is done one time a year as well. So that is something integral for us to learn. But hajj is something which is prescribed for us to do once in a lifetime. And even that, it is only prescribed for those who have the wealth to do so, number one. Number two, the health to perform it. So as long as these conditions are present for a person, then it is incumbent upon them to perform the hajj once in their lifetime. So the fact that this is only done once in a lifetime, of course, it's many people are unaware of the steps and the rules and the regulations of hajj. It's, it's one of those things that when you read about it, you kind of feel a little intimidated that I don't understand this, I don't understand that, what's this, what's that. But once you do the actions and you actually perform the steps yourself, and you perform hajj one time, and after that you will be educated, you will understand, okay, this is what we do, this is what we do. So, for example, if you were to go next year as well, inshallah, then in that particular case, you may not even have to attend a seminar because you will already be uh, aware of the rules and the regulations of hajj, simply due to your experience when you performed the hajj. So, with everything, it requires a preparation. We talk about the preparation for hajj, for example, right? And let me just give a disclaimer as well. When we talk about, we're, we're going to talk more about the spiritual aspect as well as the fiqhi rules and regulations and the steps of Hajj. We're not going to go over any logistical aspects because we're not taking a group from here. So I cannot pinpoint logistically what's going to happen. And I'm sure that everyone here has probably a different package, I'm assuming. So the fact that everyone has different packages, logistically, it's going to be different for each and every person. And I don't even know myself what the rules and regulations are with regards to the Nusuk. Uh, hajj system, so we're not going to go over any type of logistical aspects, just the steps of Hajj on its own. Uh, so I wanted to ask one question also before I begin. Uh, there's two types of Hajj primarily that are performed with the pilgrims who go from overseas. One is Hajj Tamattu' and one is Hajj Tiran. Hajj Tamattu' is such that you go to Mecca, you perform, you make, you you enter in the state of Ihram, you perform your Umrah, and then you get out of the state of Ihram. And then when the days of Hajj come, then you enter into the state of Ihram once again for Hajj. That is Hajj Tamattu. That is the most common type of Hajj that is performed for people who are who come from overseas. The second type is Hajj Qiran. Hajj Qiran is such that you enter into, you're in the state of Ihram when you enter Mecca, and you perform the, the, uh, the initial tawaf for your Umrah, now, what you do is you can either perform the sa'i immediately or you can wait and you can delay that sa'i and make it later on after the tawaf is ziyara in hajj. However, the difference is, is that you remain in the state of ihram the entire time. So you do your, your tawaf, tawaf al-qudum for, for the umrah, and then after that you remain in the state of ihram until the days of hajj start. And then you do the sa'i, if you delay the sa'i, then you do the sa'i after the tawaf is ziyara. But if you do the sa'i after the initial tawaf, then when you once you do your tawaf is ziyara, you don't have to do that sa'i after that. So does anyone is anyone here performing uh, hajj qiran? I'm assuming not because does anyone know? I know what I do. You do tawaf, okay. What? Will I have to do haram in the flight before it lands to Jeddah? Okay, so you will so you will perform your umrah. How many? How many days before the Hajj do you arrive? One day. Two days. Two days before the Hajj before, begins? Before 8th of Zilhaj, we will be there 6th of Zilhaj. Okay. Okay, so you will probably get a chance to get out of the state of Ihram and then re-enter yeah, the state of Ihram for Hajj. Yeah, okay. Products, yes. Do you know when you arrive in Makkah? First Hijjah. First of Hijjah. Okay, so you're Tamatwa then, for sure, inshallah. Okay, and you'll be in Mecca that the whole time? Yes. Okay, so inshallah, that, that should be Tamantar then as well. That should be Tamantar, because Quran typically is, is done for those who arrive, you know, maybe on the 7th of Dhul-Hijjah, or, uh, you know, usually around then, because the 8th of Dhul-Hijjah is the day that you proceed to Mina. So, okay, khair. So alhamdulillah, that makes things easier. So we'll talk about Hajj uh, Tamantar specifically. But before we go into that, the spiritual preparation for Hajj, besides your physical preparation, when it comes to packing your bags and taking what you need, there has to be a spiritual preparation for Hajj, along with you know, looking at what the rules and regulations are. From a spiritual aspect, one needs to cleanse themselves. 
And we know that Hajj itself, for the reward for an accepted Hajj is such that the forgiveness of sins to the point that a person is just like a newborn child. This is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this great, great reward for a Hajj maqbul, for a Hajj accepted Hajj. But one should, before they depart and leave, realize the journey that you are about to enter into. Realize and recognize this journey, that this is not a vacation journey. I know, mashallah, you're spending a lot of money for this, but it's not for the sake of going and you know relaxing on the beach or anything like that. This is for the sake of performing these rites and rituals, which were done by our forefather Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And speaking of that, this coming Friday, inshallah, we'll be speaking about the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam after Maghrib and tie into why is it such that these steps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the steps of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and his family in order for us to emulate. There's a reason why. And we'll talk about that this coming Friday. But the aspect of repenting from all sins, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, trying to cleanse one's heart before one entails this journey and, and enters into this journey, it's very, very important. So make tawbah, make istighfar, pray to raka of salat tawbah before you depart on this journey. And inshallah, that will be a great means of benefit. Resolve outstanding differences, ill feelings, disputes, and seek forgiveness from others. That's also very important. Many times we have these grudges against people, grudges against our own family members, grudges against other people in the community, ill feelings. And whether you feel that it was their fault or it was your own fault, you try to take the larger step. Try to take the greater step of correcting this. Try to take the greater step of going to the person and saying that, hey, I'm sorry for whatever has happened in the past. Whatever strained relations we have, I am sorry for this. Whosever fault it was, I am sorry. Because at the end of the day, it's not worth it. A person does not want to enter into such an, such an amazing journey like Hajj with any type of ill feeling towards another person. Right? And the Prophet has given glad tidings to those. For example, there's a, the one famous narration of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiya ta'ala You know, he had seen that the Prophet one time, one particular Sahabi who was a lesser known person, he kept to himself. He wasn't one of the famous Sahabis or one of the well-known people. Three days in a row, he entered the gathering of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ said, this person is a man of Jannah. This person is a man of Jannah. This person is a man of Jannah. So Abdullah ibn Amr Nas, he's thinking that, what, who is this guy? You know, what does this person do that, that the Prophet ﷺ is giving such a great glad tidings? So Abdullah ibn Amr being a young, young boy at the time, he goes to him and he says, uncle, that you know, I've had this issue with my father and, and he's kicked me out of the house. So I need a place to stay. Can I please stay with you? So of course, being the kind people that they are, he said, yes, you can stay with me. So Abdullah ibn Amr, he stays with this man, he stays in his home, and he's trying, his whole purpose is to try to see what is it that this man is doing that the Prophet ﷺ gave such glad tidings. So he sees that there's really nothing special or unique that he is doing. You know, he, he prays some salah maybe at night and then he goes to sleep. He doesn't do anything which is out, you know, outstanding or something different that no one else does at the particular time. So after the third day, then he goes to him and he says that, you know, look, I, I need to confess to you that the, the, what I said about my father, that was not true. But the reason I wanted to stay with you is because the Prophet ﷺ gave these glad tidings about you. So I want to find out what is it, what is that unique thing that you do that the Prophet ﷺ gave these glad tidings. So the person said, I cannot think of anything except that every single day, and before I go to sleep, I make sure that I have a clean heart. That my heart is not filled with any type of dispute or ill feeling or outstanding differences between anyone, between myself and anyone. I make sure that I go to sleep every day and I, I go home every day with a clean heart. And that's, what, that's when he realized, oh, subhanAllah, this is what it is, that he has a clean heart. And because of that, the Prophet ﷺ said that this is a man of Jannah. So it's very important to, to do this as well. Pay off all debts or have a payment method fixed. And this is important also, whenever a person is about to go on any journey, Regardless if you're going on Hajj or not, the aspect of having a will and making sure that any debts that one has, that that aspect is taken care of before they go on a journey. And that's very important because debts are a haq of someone else. They are a right of someone else. And the fact that it is a haq of someone else, you have to make sure that those things are taken care of or those things are at least resolved. There's a, a, a method that is fixed for that. So that way, if a person you know, if it's their time to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in that case, there is a method that is fixed for that particular regard. 
So that's another thing that's important. And make sure wealth for Hajj is from halal sources. That's also extremely vital. Anything that we do, which is in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we always make sure that we use halal wealth. I mean, we should, regardless of anything, we should always you know, strive to earn a halal wealth and a halal income. But when you're doing actions, when you're giving sadaqah in the path of Allah, when you're spending for Hajj, when you're doing all these things, make sure it is from a halal source because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and He accepts that which is pure. So make sure that uh, that is done as well. And then memorize some du'as. And, you know, whether you have a book that is filled with du'as and you read du'as, that's fine as well. But, you know, memorize some as well. You're not always going to have a book with you and always looking at all times. Even if it's simple Quranic du'as, and if, whether it's in Arabic language or it's in, in the language that you speak, any du'as are fine. The, the beautiful thing about Hajj and Umrah is that for the vast majority of it, there is no prescribed du'as. Any du'a that you make, it's flexible. And that is the beauty of, of uh, this particular journey. And there's only one dua that is prescribed. We'll talk about that uh, as we go along, inshallah. So first we go with the, with the Umrah guy before we get into Hajj itself. We talk about Ihram. Ihram itself, it comes from the word Ahrama yuhrimu Ihraman in Arabic. And it literally means to declare something unlawful upon oneself. Now, commonly speaking, people referred to ihram as the actual pieces of clothing. I'm wearing ihram. They call the pieces of clothing itself ihram. Which is nothing wrong in, in, in doing that, but ihram in the context of sharia, it actually refers to entering into a particular state. A state in which you are adhering to certain prohibitions that while you're in that state, certain things which are normally permissible for you outside of that state become unlawful for you in that particular state. So for example, when we start our salah, what do you call that first takbir? Takbir al-tahrima. So when you start your salah, things like eating, drinking, talking, things that are normally permissible outside of salah, they become haram upon a person while they are in salah. So similarly, while one is in the state of ihram, there are certain actions that must be followed, certain guidelines that must be followed, and certain things that become prohibited upon the person as long as they are in that state. And if those guidelines are violated, then there's a penalty that must be paid. We'll talk about that as well. So the wearing of the white clothes, as mentioned, it symbolizes the state, although the state is not entered into by wearing the sheets of white alone. So if you're wearing just the sheets without making the intention and whatnot, you're not in the state of ihram yet. How do you get into the state of ihram? We will talk about that. Before getting into the state of ihram, it is a sunnah to take a bath. It is a sunnah to make a ghusl. So, Alhamdulillah, um, now I know for those who will be entering initially into the state of Ihram, especially those who are flying directly into Jeddah, it will, you won't be able to take a bath most likely, and that may be difficult. So again, this is a sunnah, it's not a necessary. But before you enter into the state of Ihram for Hajj, you will probably be able, you'll probably have access to your hotel room, so you'll be able to take the ghusl or the bath at that time. So inshallah, you'll at least be able to do that. It's mustahab or a recommendation to trim hair from the from the pubic regions and other areas as well so for example for the men uh, for the mustache area pubic regions clip nails apply perfume so all of this stuff you can do before you enter into the state of ihram uh, because these things after you enter into the state it becomes prohibited to do so so for men it is preferable to wear two white new or washed sheets of cloth and alhamdulillah, we have, um, we have brand new ihrams here for all the hajjaj who are going this year. Inshallah for you to take as complimentary gift from the masjid. So it's preferable to wear two white new or washed sheets of cloth. Uh, an upper garment as well as a lower garment. Um, so again, we have that here. Each package here has two sheets. In that box, we also have like a drawstring type of bag that you can take. And in this drawstring bag, this black one, we have this wax. So you can take a few miswaks. Of course, the ihram sheets are for men, and then the drawstring bags for both men and women as well. So, so the ladies, of course, can take the miswaks and the drawstring bag, and the men can take uh, all three of these, inshallah, those who are uh, going this year. So an upper garment and a lower garment. And males should wear slippers which expose the tarsal bone or midfoot area where there is a protruding bone. So, for example, the slipper that I am wearing right now, let me just show you, this type of slipper right here, this is the best type of slipper to wear which you know when you when you when you take out all the ikhtilafat from the fuqaha and whatnot this is one that covers all the opinions so this is the best one and of course my um my recommendation is to find these types of slippers which are 
comfortable. Don't get those flat ones which are very uncomfortable when you walk. Get something which is more padded because there will be a lot of walking involved. So make sure you get um, a couple of pairs of these particular slippers. And again, this rule is only for men when it comes to this aspect of the uncovering of the foot. This is not uh, a rule for women. For females, of course, they don't wear the sheets as men wear. They may wear the regular clothing like an abaya, scarf, gloves, socks, and shoes. The only restriction for the female is that the face must not have anything touching it. So, for example, a, a, a sister who practices the face veil or the niqab, for her, she cannot wear the niqab physically that's touching the face. One way around it for her is that she can wear like a, a baseball cap or a visor and then put the sheet kind of over that hanging. So that way there's a space between her face and the sheet. The sheet itself is not touching her face physically. So that's kind of like a hila or a way around this particular rule. Otherwise, those who do not wear the niqab, then they just wear the headscarf and the abaya, but they leave the face uncovered. So before entering into the state of ihram, it is also a sunnah to perform two rakah of salah before entering into this state. So if one is on the plane, this is a nafil salah, so you can even pray the salah on the seat of your, of your uh, flight as well, which is fine. So you can pray the two rakah of salah while in your seat in the, in the plane. And for those who are maybe going, going to Medina first, Allahu Adam, then you can uh, pray it over there. It's preferable, but again, this is not anything which is necessary, reciting Surah Kafirun in the first rakah, Surah Ikhlas in the second rakah. Either way, that is fine. And by the way, let me just uh, tell everyone as well that this, this entire presentation that I have, I do have it in PDF form. So that Hajj and Umrah group that we have, I will send the entire PDF to the group. So that way you don't have to, you know, take the, if you're writing all these notes right now and then you feel it's hard to write notes and pay attention at the same time, you can always take a look at it uh, afterwards and it will be uh, any accessible to all of you. When should ihram be worn? So it is necessary to wear the ihram before passing the miqat boundary. This is a common question that comes up. Many people ask the question that, can I land Jeddah? And can I wear the ihram after I get into Jeddah? The answer is no, because Jeddah is within the miqat. So those who are coming from overseas, since Jeddah is already in the miqat, you must have your ihram, you must be in the state of ihram before landing in Jeddah. Now, typically what happens is that either one of two things. The place that a person has a stopover, for example, if someone's taking Turkish Airlines and they stop in Istanbul, many times what they will do is they'll change into the clothing of ihram the, the, at that particular time in the airport, and then they'll make the intention as they're on the flight and you know when they're getting closer towards Jeddah, because typically what happens is that the pilot or someone, they know that most of the people are the Hajjaj who are going to Jeddah, so they announce on the plane that we are approaching the Miqat, so make your intention now. So they will be announcing that on the plane. So. Either you can do that or you can take the sheets with you and you can change on the plane, which is at times it's difficult because those plane restrooms are very small. The only airline which it's easier to do that is Saudi Airlines because they have that uh, whole prayer room area in, in the back of the, of, the, of the plane. So it becomes a little easier to change over there. But I highly recommend that uh, wherever your stopover is to uh, change in that particular place and wear the clothing over there for those who are going directly uh, to Jeddah, it will be a lot easier for you. So the miqat is the outer boundary from where those wishing to perform Hajj or Umrah must enter into the state of Ihram. So the two boundaries which are, are of concern to us the most, going from America, is the Dhul Hulayfa boundary, which is north of Mecca. So those who are coming from Medina to Mecca, the Dhul Hulayfa boundary, which is literally just outside of Medina, five minutes outside of Medina, literally is the Dhul Hudayfa boundary. Like when you're taking the train, for example, the new, the new railway that they have, five minutes after the, the departure of the train, you already reach the Miqat. So that's that one. The other one is, of course, the um, western one, the, the, the second one here, Al-Juhfa, the northwest of Mecca. This is applicable to those who come from the west. So this is the one that is applicable to those who are coming from uh, Jeddah or from coming from the Western world, yani before and en entering to Jeddah, that is the uh, Mipat boundary over there. And again, they will announce on the plane when you are about to enter the particular boundary. Just a little map here. So again, Dhul Hudayfa all the way to the north on top, and then you can see Al-Juhfa uh, over there on the side. You can also see you know, where, where Jeddah is over there. 
So now entering into the state of ihram, you have the clothing on, but you haven't entered into the actual state yet. What do you do? You pray the turaqa of salah. Okay, that's done. So now after praying the turaqa of salah, if one is able to pray it, this is what's necessary. So the shower is sunnah. The turaqa of salah is also a sunnah. If you're unable to do both of those, it's not going to affect you getting into the state of ihram. But these things that's mentioned here on this slide, this is what is a necessity to get into the state of ihram. So this is what you have to do. And this doesn't require any other special thing. This just requires an intention. So number one is the niyyah, the intention. Secondly, then after making the intention, reciting the talbiyah. So I'll mention that in just a moment. But the dua, any dua can be recited, any intention, whether it's in your language, whether it's in Arabic, Allahumma inni uridul umrah fayassir hali wa taqabbalha minni. That, oh Allah, uh, I... I intend to perform the Umrah, so make it easy for me and accept it from me. This is just uh, an example. And whether it's done verbally with the tongue or it's done in the heart, it's fine. It's the intention. And then after the intention is made, one should recite the talbiyah with the intention of coming to the ihram. What is the talbiyah? It is the answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's invite and his call. We know, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ and this should be recited audibly, right? So the niya can be done in the heart, but the talbiya must be recited audibly. This is, of course, you're answering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're saying, here I am at your service, O Allah, here I am. Here I am, there is no partner for you, here I am. Truly, all praise, favors, and sovereignty are yours. There is no partner for you. So once you recite, once you make the intention and you recite the talbiya, now officially, one is into the state of ihram, and those prohibitions that are, uh, that are, of course, there in that state, they now begin and they apply. So regarding some virtues, Sahar ibn Sa'd radiallahu anhu, he reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, when a believer recites the talbiyah, verily every stone, tree, and even the ground around him recite the talbiyah along with the person, subhanAllah. So this is beautiful because these objects which are inanimate to us, they will be a means of a witness to the person on the day of judgment, saying, Oh Allah, such and such person answered your call on this day and on this time. Ya Allah, this person was there answering to you. This person was there about to perform the Hajj. Ya Allah, forgive this person. So this is a, a beautiful thing. So the Talbiya, it should be recited as much as possible. And this is until one reaches the Kaaba and before they, they uh, begin their Tawaf. So up till that whole point, the Talbiya should be frequently recited as much as possible. Men should recite a little more audibly, of course, without disturbing others. Women should recite a little more quietly. And the talbiyah should be recited individually as much as possible. So during the state of ihram, committing sins are even more forbidden. In fact, ulama mentions, some scholars even mention that, uh, can we, uh, if we can take questions, I think, after afterwards, you know, at, at least after certain sections, then we'll take questions. Otherwise, then it, I think it will disturb the flow, inshallah. So, so inshallah, once, before we begin the next portion, I'll take questions about a certain portion and then we'll go on inshallah to the next one. Jazakallah. So sins are even more emphatically forbidden in the state of ihram. And there are many ulama who even mention this aspect that when one is in this state and they perform a sin in that state, then it is even worse yani, than a person who's performing a, state, a, a sin outside of the state of ihram. And the reason why they mention that is because one is in that state of... of uh, purely cleansing themselves. They're in a state where they are going to this place for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there's any time that you are thinking about, you know, being in obedience to Allah and refraining from disobedience, it should be this time. But yet if a person is still thinking about disobedience during this time, then it kind of goes along with that hadith of the Prophet where he talks about the aspect of haya and modesty that yeah, they do as you wish, as the Prophet has said in that, in that particular narration. So this is what some of the scholars mention, but of course, one should recognize and realize the state that they are in and realize that, you know, just as Alhamdulillah, and, I, I, and, and at least in my experience is such that just like when a person is fasting here in Ramadan, how much easier it is to refrain from sin. Similarly, when a person is in the state of Ihram, it's so much easier to refrain from that which is in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you realize and recognize the state that you are in, the spiritual state that you are in to answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the invite from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So things like foul language, fighting, quarreling are forbidden as well. Now, this is also a thing that, that comes as a test. You know, there's so many people over there that are together. No doubt there's going to be pushing, there's going to be shoving, there's going to be shouting, there's going to be people saying things. You know, don't be one of those who 
<laughs> say things to people. Don't be one of those who who say who use vulgar language towards others. Don't be one of those who physically push people and you know shout at people and things like that. There are going to be people like that, unfortunately. But Allah subhanahu wa taala tests your patience from the beginning. Trust me, I know this because I have had experience from it. Your patience is going to be tested in many many different ways, and this is all part of the journey. The the aspect of uh, patience being tested. So refrain from all of these things. Respect one another. Uh, you know, show kindness towards one another. If somebody needs help, help them. This is the way of a believer and a believer, uh, and then the way of a Muslim. All forms of intimacy with one's spouse is also forbidden while in the state of ihram. Wearing day-to-day -day clothing, this is for men particularly, like the jabba or the shirt or trousers or anything else, that's prohibited. So for men, the only thing that can be worn, of course, are the two sheets. And there are some other things that can be worn. We'll talk about that will also come up in the in the presentation before I mention it. So hats also, uh, that, that's very important. So for example, a kufi, a kufi cannot be worn in the state of ihram. One has to be a bareheaded uh, when in that state. Using any type of fragrances, it is not allowed. If anyone using, is using unscented soap or anything unscented, that is permissible. But anything with a fragrance or a scent, that is not allowed. Removal of any type of hair, including body hair, is prohibited. So to comb, pluck, trim, or cut hair is not allowed. Clipping the nails is also prohibited. And wearing footwear, this is for men, wearing footwear covering the shoelace area is also prohibited. Hence why I had mentioned the type of slipper that one should purchase. Okay, we mentioned this already. It's forbidden for a male to cover the head with something touching the head, for example, a kufi. For a male and a female to cover the face in a manner that something is touching the face. I had talked about that already. And hopefully these, these other two, this is just mentioned in fiqh books, but nowadays, alhamdulillah, there's no need to hunt. There's plenty of places to eat over there, not like the olden days. And to kill lice. Hopefully nobody has that issue over there as well, because that entails the aspect of, you know, uh, taking hair and, and, and things like that. So any of these actions will result in a type of penalty, whether mistakenly done or forgetfully done. The penalties, we'll talk about that as well in this, uh, in this um, presentation. Okay, permissible acts in ihram. So while in the state of ihram, what are some things that can be worn? So having a shower for purification or for coolness. So if somebody takes a shower, uh, without using, obviously, without using any type of scented shampoo or scented or scented soap, you know, for the purpose of cooling, wetting oneself, um, taking a shower, that is fine. So if you're in those sheets, you can, you can, if you go for a shower, you can remove the sheets, you can take the sheets off, and you can shower, and then you can put the sheets back on. That is, that is fine to do that. That is permissible. Uh, but just be careful to not take any hair out or to use anything scented. So you using unscented soap again. Now, when it says it's not preferable to remove dirt, um, I think the reason why that's mentioned is because when one is taking any type of dirt or anything off, it, it entails a lot of rubbing and, you know, being more aggressive and then, you know, hair can be removed in that particular way. So that's another uh, issue. Injections, if anyone needs an injection or a shot, that is permissible to get. Bandages, if anyone has a if you get a cut, you wear a bandage, that is permissible to wear in the state of Ihram. If anyone has a cast, or a brace, it is permissible to wear that in the state of Ihram, it's not going to affect. Sunglasses, or glasses in general, or a watch, that is also allowed. So if one, if one has glasses, a watch, you can wear a watch. Uh, even, even, a, even a belt, as mentioned here. So a lot of people, what they do is they wear a money belt, or they wear some type of belt on the bottom Ihram piece to tighten it even more. It is permissible to do that, it's not going to affect the state of Ihram, that is, it is fine to do that. Changing, I don't know why this is mentioned in the in the fiqh aspects, but uh, changing a diaper maybe because of the because of the najasa that's involved in there, but that is it's permissible to do that. Using the swak is also allowed. One should not use any type of scented toothpaste uh, in the state of ihram. This is why it's one of the times where using the miswak is very beneficial, and inshallah it's going to be you know a great habit to use over there. It has the, the same type of benefits, so use the miswak inshallah. It's permissible to wrap oneself in a blanket, however, do not cover the face or the head, otherwise it will entail the penalty. And, of course, generally speaking, hunting or killing any animals is not allowed in the state of Ihram. However, pests, for example, flies, wasps, mosquitoes, any type of these types of pests, if one uh, kills these types of uh, bugs or, or whatever, it is, it's not going to affect uh, anything in Ihram. 
Okay. Gotta be at a, so before we get to the aspect of Umrah, we had a, quite a question for this. Uh, yeah, my question was like, as you're going into the state of Islam, do you mm -hmm. have to make wuzu before you make the niyyah and go into So, yeah, so we had mentioned, I don't know if you were here before we talked about it, the sunnah is to take a ghusl, is to make the shower. But if one, if one cannot make a shower, then at least, yes, at, at least, you know, try to make, even if one cannot make wudu, technically, because the turaka of salah that's done before then, it's a sunnah. So if one cannot even do that, it's actually not necessary to even make wudu. The only thing that's necessary to enter into the state of ihram is the niyyah and the talbiyah. That's it. So as long as one has the clothing on and they make the niyyah and the talbiyah, regardless of whether they have wudu at that point or they don't have wudu at that point, they'll be in the state of ihram at that particular point. Okay, so as we mentioned, the ghusl to get into the state of ihram is a sunnah. The turaka is a sunnah. Ihram with the intention of talbiyah, that is a fallad condition, so that's easy to do. Tawaf for Umrah, that is also a requirement, that is also a fallad. The turaka salah after tawaf is a wajib, that is also a necessity. The sa'i between safa and marwa, that is also a wajib and necessity. And then finally, the halaq or the shaving or trimming of the hair, that is also a wajib. We'll talk about that when we get to that particular point. So as you enter Makkah, you should enter with utmost humbleness. You know, realizing that this is not a sightseeing trip, but rather you are entering the holiest of cities and the holiest of places, Masjid al-Haram, the, the site of Baytullah, the Kaaba itself. So it's advisable for those who are going to uh, perform the Umrah first and foremost to, before you actually go and perform the Umrah when you arrive there, get some rest inshallah because it will re there will be a lot of people in the Hajj season and it will require a lot of walking and a lot of time. So try to get some rest. Uh, and try to perform Umrah at a time when the heat is less as, as well. We know that we're getting it, we're in the summer days now and it's extremely hot over there nowadays. I've been looking at the temperatures over there. You know, it's, it's, it seems like it's pretty hot nowadays over there now. So you, know, you have to be a little more careful and you, know, you have to make sure that you take your time when you are um, performing these rites and these rituals. The good news is, Alhamdulillah, there is Zamzam access all around the masjid. So you can keep refreshing yourself, whether it's drinking it or even taking a cup and just pouring it on your head to cool down, it will be a great means of, of uh, benefit for you as well. So one should be engaged in reciting the talbiyah all the while before starting the actual tawaf. Enter the masjid with your right foot as you would do with any masjid. And, you know, send salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ as well. Proceed towards the Kaaba not as a tourist, but as a servant with utmost humbleness. So for those who are the... Um, for who are the pilgrims, there's a couple of places that are designated for the pilgrims to enter. You will see that when you go there, what, what are the designated entrances that there are for those who are, who are the pilgrims. My advice to everyone always is when you enter the masjid, keep your gaze down, because the reason why I say that is because you don't want to get a slight glimpse of the Kaaba as your first glimpse. You want to go to a place where you get to look up and you see the Kaaba in its, in its entirety as a whole. So try to keep your gaze lowered until you get to a point where you can see the Kaaba in front of you with a beautiful sight. And this is the place where you stop and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You pour your heart, heart out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's another uh, piece of advice that I always give people as well that, you know, I know, I know a lot of people at that moment, they're very, they're so in awe of the Kaaba that, you know, any du'as that you may have thought of before, there are times where you may forget the du'as. Of course, you can make the du'a that, oh Allah, those du'as that, I have forgotten, please accept those du'as because Allah is all-knowing. But it's always advisable also that any du'as that you can think of, make a note of it. Whether you write it on your phone, whatever it may be, make a note of all these du'as and whatever du'as you're making from your heart, make those from your heart. Whatever du'as you want to read from your phone, read those du'as from your phone. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take as long as you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these du'as because this is a time of acceptance when you see the Kaaba. So the Kaaba itself, as we see over here, there's uh, particular aspects about it. We're not going to go into hold the whole history and all that stuff because we don't have time about that. But when you see the Kaaba, you have the corner, of course, with the Hajj al-Aswad or the black stone. Um, and you'll see a line with the black stone when you look up, you'll see particular lights. So you'll know that once I am aligned with the black stone, you'll see the light on the other side of the masjid. And you'll know when to make the, when, when to make the indication. We'll talk about that as well. But between the... Of course, you see between the area of the black stone and the door of the Kaaba is the Multazam area. And for those who are able to cling on to that area and make dua, this is also a place of acceptance, but it's extremely crowded. 
in, in those particular areas. So those who desire, I know many people desire, everyone desires to get to that area, but if you see pushing and shoving, honestly, it's, it's worse in my opinion to try to push and shove and try to get to that place rather than being respectful of other people and saying that, oh Allah, I had the intention of going there and making dua, but I realized that because of the difficulty of doing so and, and to avoid pushing and shoving others, but Ya Allah, please make it such that as if I'm touching the multism or the black stone that accept my du'as from me. Allah is al karim he is, he is the one who knows what our intentions are. But at the same time, we have to respect uh, the honor of, of our fellow brothers and sisters as well. So just because you see other people doing it, doesn't mean that we should be on the same level as them and we should push them. We should take the higher road and we should try to, inshallah, be respectful and mindful of others. So you have the door of the, the Kaaba as well. In front of, on, on the front side of the Kaaba, you have the Maqam Ibrahim, where the rock is displayed. This was the rock that Ibrahim والسلام, stood upon. Allah SWT made the ground soft for him and made it such that it was elevated for him so that he and Ismail والسلام, were able to build up the foundations of the Kaaba at that uh, particular time. So the, with, so the rock with the step, footstep of Ibrahim والسلام, is still there. And of course, after the tawaf is over, we are taught to pray to Raka'a of Salah, you know, behind the area of the Maqam Ibrahim as, you know, a way of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you have the Hatim area on the side. So before, originally, the foundational aspect of the Kaaba, the Kaaba itself was actually more of a rectangular shape than a cube shape. But that was cut off at a certain period. So one cannot cut through the Hatim in any way it's gated off. So you cannot go through there from that side. So you have to go around that Hatim area in order to fulfill the uh, full type of tawaf. Then you have the various corners, the, the particularly the Yemeni corner, which is before the Hajar e Aswad, that last side of the uh, of the Kaaba, this is where the Prophet has taught us to make the dua Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar. So that is literally the only prescribed dua that the Prophet has told us to do while doing tawaf, while doing sa'i, or anything else. Besides that, any dua that you make, any salawat you make, any adhkar you make, any Qur'anic recitation you do, it's flexible for anyone to do what they can while they are doing these uh, actions. So tawaf is a compulsory part of the umrah and the hajj. It is to walk around the Kaaba seven times. And it is wajib and necessary to have wudu when performing tawaf. So when you're doing sa'i between Safa and Marwa, wudu is actually not a condition. It's not necessary to have wudu in that state. But for tawaf, it is necessary for one to be in the state of wudu. So therefore, for example, if one begins their tawaf and they break their wudu in the middle of tawaf, then they must walk out and do the wudu and come back in and then resume tawaf from where they left off. You don't have to restart tawaf again. You resume from where you left off. So to proceed, to begin the tawaf, one should proceed to the corner where the hajr aswad is, where the black stone is. So you walk up to that particular point and this is the area before the waf begins where men should uncover their right shoulder. While they're wearing the two sheets, uncover the right shoulder and leave the right shoulder exposed. This is called ittiba. Ittiba should be done shortly before the tawaf begins. And once the tawaf is completed, all seven rounds, then one should cover up that shoulder once again. And obviously for women, they must not uncover any part of the body. And this is the time where the recitation of the talbiyah ends. So up till this point, you've been reciting labbaik, Allahumma labbaik frequently. And then of course, you, when you saw the Kaaba, you make dua, you recite talbiyah again. It's right before you start the tawaf, before you align yourself with the hajr aswad before the tawaf commences, this is when you stop the talbiyah. And now the talbiyah will cease. The talbiyah recitation will be done. So step in line with the black stone and face towards the black stone. Now there's two actions that need to be done initially. One is istiqbal, and the second is istilam. What is istiqbal? Istiqbal is to raise one's hands, for example, just the way that one raises in salah, face the black stone and say, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. And istiqbal is only done one time when you begin the tawaf. It is only done one time. So after raising the hands and saying Allah or saying Allahu Akbar la ilaha illallah, right? This is a stikbab. Raising the hands saying Allahu Akbar la ilaha illallah. One will then put the hands back down to one side. So this is only done one time when the tawaf is commenced. What about istilam? Istilam is to make some sort of contact directly or indirectly with the hajr aswad So if one is, uh, is able to touch the black stone 
without pushing, without shoving or some difficulty, then one should place both hands and kiss the black stone. If one cannot do so, then touching it will suffice. However, both these things nowadays are extremely difficult with the amount of people. So, it is sufficient to be in line with the black stone, facing it from a distance, with the palms of both hands raised, raised and facing the black stone and saying, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, the istikbal, that's only done one time. But istilab is done that time, and every single time that one round is done, you will say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Then again, one more round, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Then again, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So, istilab is done a total of eight times. In the beginning, the first time, and then after each and every round. So after the seventh round is done, that will be the eighth time that you will do istilam and that will be done. So again, istighbal only done one time, Allah Akbar, la ilaha illallah, while istilam is done eight times total. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So you will, you know, raise your hands and say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, uh, each time that you complete. So after the seventh round is done, the eighth time you say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, then your tawaf will be completed. But after performing the istilam, one begins the tawaf of the Kaaba. So a male will walk briskly in the first three rounds if possible. This is called Raman. But if it is not possible because of the crowds or having to look after one's family, one can walk normally. If females do not do Raman, they will walk normally. Raman will only be performed in the first three rounds and not the last four rounds. In the last four rounds, a male should walk normally. So Raman and Ittiba which is again, Ramal is walking these three briskly for males, if it's possible, and ittiba, uncovering of the right shoulder. This only takes place in the tawaf, which has a sa'i after it. So for example, the tawaf of Umrah, you will be doing it then. Or the tawaf of ziyara, that is done in the time of Hajj, you will be also doing it at that particular time. If, and that, and that is if, uh, again, that is if the, the uh, aspect of the ihram is still on and if one is still in that state at that point, because there are some people who perform that tawaf while in that state. There are some people who perform the sacrifice of their animal after um, the tawaf is ziyara, and we'll talk about that when the hajj steps come up. In nafil tawaf, when one is just doing it in their regular clothing, then one will not perform ramal and itiba. And the nafil tawafs over there, they're not done on the ground level where the Kaaba is. That's only for those who are in the state of ihram. Uh, on the other levels of the masjid, there are particular levels for those who are engaged in the nafil tawaf. Okay, we already mentioned that one must walk around the hatim and not cut through, and you can't do that anyway because it's gated off. During the tawaf, recite anything, Quran, dhikr, and make dua. One should also avoid talking about unnecessary matters while performing the tawaf. And one should not read in such a loud manner in which it disturbs others as well. It is disliked to also eat anything while one is making the tawaf. But if, if one does any of these things, it's not going to break the tawaf. But it's just a disliked thing to do. However, one may drink zamzam in between if one becomes thirsty. And there's zamzam access all around over there. So alhamdulillah, that is one of the great blessings uh, to be over there. While performing tawaf, if one's wudu breaks, I had mentioned this, or a farad salah starts, or one needs to take a break simply, then it is permissible to pause the tawaf, go on the side, take a little break, take some rest, and then continue from the place where a person had stopped to take a break. One does not make any gesture to any other corner of the Kaaba besides the corner with the black stone. So it's only when every time we get to that, that uh, alignment with the black stone where one will make the, put their hands up and say Bismillah Allah Akbar for the istilam. But one does not make indication to any other part. It's mustahab to touch the Yemeni corner if possible, but again, it's very difficult because of the, because of the crowds over there. But if one cannot touch it, then one should not gesture over it. The only reason why it's mentioned it's mustahab is because there is a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ himself did do this. And the Ruknu Yamani or the Yemeni corner should not be kissed. You'll see a lot of people there engaged in some of these bid'at and some of these actions where people are, you know, kissing the Yemeni corner or they're just, you know, clinging on to different parts of the Kaaba and kissing those parts and things like that. These aren't, these things aren't from the Sunnah. Of course, they're doing it from their own love of the Kaaba. But, you know, these are, these are things that uh, one should try to particularly avoid because the Prophet did not prescribe those actions. So the tawaf is completed upon making istilam of the hajr aswad or the black stone at the end of the seventh round. So this, again, as I said, this will be the eighth istilam in total. It is wajib then to perform two rakahs of salah after the tawaf is over. The two rakahs should not be performed in the times of karaha, like when the sun is rising or when the sun is at its peak or when the sun is setting. 
So it's preferable to perform these two rakahs behind Maqam Ibrahim, but if there's not sufficient space, then one can perform these two rakahs anywhere in the masjid. Once you are done with these two rakahs of salah, then you can proceed towards the area, the mas'a, to perform the sa'i, which is of course the place where Hajar alayhi salam uh, was left by Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam with the command of Allah, with the infant Ismail alayhi salatu salam. And once her provisions of her dates and, and bag of water ran out, then of course she was, she had her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but she was, you know, running back and forth between these two hills, looking for someone to see if anyone is there to help or assist. And then, of course, we know the angel uh, Jibreel والسلام, came and tapped the ground and, of course, the, the, the uh, spring of Zamzam or the well of Zamzam was uh, brought from that point, which is, of course, Alhamdulillah, till today, it is, of course, gushing and it is flowing. So, Sa'i is a wajib element in the Umrah. It is performed after the Tawaf and it is to walk between the two hills of Safa and Marwa. And all the signs are there, the indications are there in terms of where to go and how to get there. So you start at Safa and you end at Marwa. It's done seven times. So Safa to Marwa is one. Marwa back to Safa, that's two. Safa back to Marwa, that's three. So you'll start at Safa. By the time we're done with round number seven, you're going to end up at Marwa. So that is uh, what it is over there. The place where it is called, where it is carried out is called the Masa'a. Now the Masa'a has different levels. Whether you perform it on the ground level or you perform it on the second level or the third level or whatever it may be. It's all valid in, in, in any level. So you may, if you go to a higher level, you'll probably find that it, it will be less crowded. So if it's easier for you and you'd like to do that, it is permissible to make the sa'i on a higher level and it will, inshallah, you'll get the, the, of course, it will be the same ritual will be carried out. After performing the two for tawaf, one should go in line with the hajj aswad again and try to do istilam for the commencement of sa'i. This is not a necessity to do, but if one does it, then it's fine. Um, because with the crowd over there, it, it, it gets difficult at times to do that. And then you exit the masjid and head towards the Safa Hillock, which is located in the Mas'ah. The reason why it's saying you exit the masjid is because from a technical standpoint, the area where Safa and Marwa is, is actually, from a technical standpoint, considered outside of Masjid al-Haram itself, even though it's all within the same ground, but it's actually considered uh, outside the ground, which is why, for example, if a woman is in Hayd, for example, you know, from the from the the ruling, in particular ruling about a woman who cannot be in the masjid, what's designated as a masjid in the ruling of Hayd, she can be in the area where software the mas'a is because that's not considered as uh, a part of the masjid technically. These are all older pictures, but we all know that extension area. Now, now with that whole construction area going on, you know things. A lot. There's a lot of construction, a lot of work going on there. So, but they've opened a lot of new areas now that were being built. So one stands on the Safa Hillock and you face the Qibla, you can say Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. It's not, again, these things are not, it's not necessary to do that. But every time you, before you begin the Sa'i itself, and any time you go between Safa and Marwa, you can stop at each place if you would, if you would like, and you can make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you stop and make dua or you're just making dua constantly while walking, it is fine to do that in either way. Now there is a particular area where the green lights are approaching between one light to another, uh, where males should run until the next green light, or at least not run, but walk a little more briskly. It, depending on the crowd and how many people are there, it may be a little difficult to do that. So if it is difficult, just try to walk a little more briskly, not particularly run because one may hurt someone or one may injure another person. And again, that's to symbolize the um, the brisk walking or running of Hajar alayhi salam when she was, you know, going back and forth between the two hills. The women will not run between the two green lights at the Masa'ah. So when a person reaches Marwa, one lap has been completed. Then Marwa again, one, one faces the direction of the Qibla, and you can say Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, and then make dua if you would like to. And then again, you head towards Safa, and then that will be the second lap. And then again, Safa to Marwa, that will be the third lap, and so on and so forth. So one starts at Safa, and by the time the seventh lap is done, then you reach Marwa. So this is the Safa mountain here. It's blocked off itself. It's just, you know, the whole ground is kind of covered in, in the marble now. After standing on Marwa the seventh time, then it's mustahab to perform two rakahs of salah in the masjid. But if one cannot do that, again, it's fine because of the crowds that are over there. So with Sa'i, it is not necessary to have wudu. 
With tawaf it is, but with sa'i it is not necessary to have wudu. So if one breaks their wudu while doing sa'i, one can still continue to do sa'i even in, this, in that state without going to make wudu again. One should engage in dhikr and dua. Again, it's flexible to make any dhikr and dua. A lot of times when people start the, 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 the sa'i, then they recite the verses in the Quran, inna safa wal marwata min sha'a ilillah. But again, this is not a necessity to do that. One can make any dua that they would like to. If a salah starts or one needs to take a break, then it is permissible to continue from where one paused. So obviously if one breaks wudu while they're making a sa'i and now a salah is beginning, then, then you have to, of course, make wudu to pray the salah. Otherwise, if a salah is not going on, one just simply wants to take a break, they can do that and they can continue on then from where they left off in their, in their sa'i. Once the sa'i is done, then the only step that's left after this is to shave or to trim the hair. So for men, of course, the aspect of shaving the head is recommended. At the very least, trimming the hair, this is wajib, to come out of the state of ihram. Uh, shaving is better than trimming the hair. So it's permissible to cut, cut one's own hair or to go to the barbers. The barbers are if you look at the uh, clock tower mall on the left side of the clock tower, if you're facing towards the clock tower mall on the left side, there's an area called the Safwa Towers. So on the, on the bottom level of that area, you'll find all the barbers there. So when you go out, usually you have people out there waiting for people who have completed their rights to go out there and they kind of you know take you to a barber shop. But everything's the same over there. It's like 10 reals to get uh, the haircut over there and then it's done. For women, they must only cut a portion of the hair. So for women, uh, the rules and regulations, there's a couple of opinions. In the Hanafi school, at the, the minimum that should be cut is the, if you look at the fingertip up to the first joint, so just about that much in size, you know, to the, from the fingertip to the first joint, that amount, that length uh, for the length of hair, that is, uh, you know, that should be done in the Hanafi standpoint. In the Shafi school, the minimal amount is just three strands of hair. So very, very simple, very easy. Three strands can be cut and then it will be done. So one should just, you know, at least take a handful little portion and cut off and then the requirement will be done for, for women. Okay, once a person cuts the hair and the haircut is, is done, then now they are free of the laws of ihram. So even if you're still in the clothing that you're wearing, you haven't gone to your hotel, taken a shower yet, all the rules and regulations that were prohibited upon you while in the state of ihram, they are now gone. So you can now put on scent, you can do whatever else you want. You can Typically what people do is they go to their hotel and then they shower and they use scented soap and all of that. And your umrah and everything is officially complete. Okay, important rules for females. While, perform, while in the state of hayd, performing salah, fasting, reciting the Quran, now, with the recitation of Quran aspect, then I know there's some differences of opinion with that particular regard uh, in, in, in various schools. This is particularly more from the Hanafi uh, school aspect with regards to that. But du'as from the Quran, they can be still recited even in the state of hayd. So whether it's uh, like Surah Fatiha, which is also a du'a, Ayatul Kursi, or any other du'as that are Quranic du'as, those can be recited even in that particular state. Or touching the Quran, entering the masjid as well. Performing tawaf in that state, intimate relations, we know that, and fulfilling one's passions uh, in this particular way, this is also things which are prohibited. Now the issue is, a woman will not perform the turaqahs of salah before, in the, before entering into the state of ihram, if she is in the state of hayd in that particular time. She will merely recite the talbiyah and make the niyyah to come into the state of ihram. She is allowed to recite the talbiyah or any dua in that particular state. But what she cannot do according to the Hanabi school is recite Quran, and of course, we know from any school performing salah or entering the masjid or performing tawaf in that particular state. So she will not enter Masjid al-Haram until after she is pure from uh, the hayd state and she has taken the ghusl or the shower. If she has entered into the state of ihram and was experiencing the hayd, she will not perform the umrah until after she becomes free of that particular state. She will have to remain in the state of ihram with the prohibitions upon her until she gets free of that state. But if she could not perform umrah due to the hajj days beginning and she is still in that state, now what happens? Then she should release herself from the state of ihram of umrah 
and now enter into the state of ihram for hajj. However, what needs to be done now in that case is that a qada of the umrah will have to be done afterwards and a dumb penalty, which is the, the arrangement of slaughtering the goat or the sheep size animal, that also has to be made. And there are places in the haram area where that arrangement will have to be made. Umrah should not be performed between the 9th and 13th by, by men and women because the Hajj rites are going on. Now, there's another question here that comes up for the women who are in the state of Hayb. Um, what if, for example, she could not perform the Umrah due to the state? And now what if immediately after the Hajj days she is departing and she is leaving and she cannot make Qadha of the, of the Umrah? Now what happens? So now more contemporary scholars have given a ruling that if this is the last, last case scenario, because technically what happens is that it remains a qada upon her. Now, what then, then in, as a very, very last, last case scenario, what she should do then is that even if she's in the state of hayb, then she should still go into the masjid, make the tawaf even in the state of impurity, and then make the sa'i as well. Do not pray the two of salah, but you know, make the tawaf, make the sa'i. But what will have to happen is that in that case is that the major penalty will be due upon her. So at least at the end of the day, she will have to pay that major penalty, but the qada will not have to be done then. The major penalty is the slaughtering of a larger animal like the cow or the camel. And again, these, these um, things can be arranged over there. They have places in the clock tower mall and other areas where a person can pay cash or they can pay their money and arrange these types of slaughterings for the penalty. So, um, so obviously, you know, this is... The sisters themselves, of course, know the habit of their cycles, and there are other ways where if one feels like, okay, these, this is my regularly scheduled habit, and these are the days where it's going to happen, there are, of course, methods out there, you know, using pills or whatever it may be to kind of delay the process, so that way one can, inshallah, ensure that in these days, that, that, that hopefully, inshallah, that this will not have to happen or this will not occur. So it's permissible to use those means to delay that particular habit. Okay, the Umrah is then complete and you, you are free of all the prohibitions, alhamdulillah. So that covers a lot of ground with that particular aspect. Now, of course, when we go for the Hajj aspect, which, you know, is also, of course, one of the main, main reasons that's going on over there. First of all, the rewards of performing Hajj itself, as we know, we see from various ahadith of Prophet ﷺ, um, this is a agreed upon hadith over here that Prophet ﷺ was asked, which is the best action? He replied, belief in Allah and His Messenger. And then what? Jihad fi sabilillah. And then what? Then a hajj, a, you know, a hajj mabrur, or a accepted hajj from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is considered as, you know, one of the best and greatest actions. So the performance of Umrah is an expiation for the sins committed between it and the previous ones. And the reward for hajj mabrur is nothing but jannah. Just imagine, subhanAllah. So you do a hajj mabrur, inshallah, you follow the rules and the guidelines, and then inshallah a person is given paradise because of that particular action. This is a hadith which comes in Sahih al-Bukhari. Whoever performs hajj to this house, the Kaaba, and does not perform, commit any obscenity or wrongdoing, and he or she will come out as the day that he or she was born, pure and free of sins. Another great benefit. Okay, the overview of hajj. Getting into the state of ihram for hajj is obligatory. Wuquf in mina on the 8th. We'll go over each and every one of these inshallah. That is a sunnah to remain in the Asma in Mina. Wuquf in Arafa, that is also uh, an obligatory portion of Hajj. Wuquf in Muzdalifa is a wajib part of Hajj. Then Wuquf in Mina afterwards is sunnah, while one is in Mina on, on these days, the 10th, 11th, and 12th. On the 10th, particularly the Rami or the pelting of the big pillar, that is a necessity. Then you make the Nahar or the slaughtering of your Hadi, the, the Hajj animal. And then you make the halaq or the qasr, the trimming of the hair for the hajj. And then you go back to Mecca and you make the tawaf ziyara and the sa'i for hajj. That is also a necessity to do. Then you go back to Mina again on the 11th and the 12th at a minimum. You make the rami of all three pillars on each day. And either one leaves Mina before sunset of the 12th or if one stays in Mina, then on the 13th it becomes necessary for them to also make the pelting of all three, uh, of all three pillars before going back to Mecca and making the Tawafi Wada and leaving. So that was just a very brief, we're going to go over each and every one of these, inshallah, on its own. So one should come into the state of Ihram. We already talked about how to come into the state of Ihram. It's the same way, again, to do so for 
the aspect of Hajj. Except when you're making your intention, you don't say that, oh, Allah, I'm intending to perform Umrah. You say, oh, Allah, I'm intending to perform Hajj. So make it easy for me and accept it from me. By the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, one should come into the state of Ihram for Hajj. It is better to come into the state of Ihram for Hajj prior to the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, if possible. But if one does it on the 8th, which most people do, then it is fine to do that. It's preferable to come into the state of Ihram in Masjid al-Haram. However, it is permissible to do so from one's hotel. So there's a difference. For example, when you perform your first Umrah and you want to perform a second Umrah, people typically, they go to Masjid Aisha outside the boundary for the residents of Mecca. And then they renew their intention there and they come back. But for to make uh, to get into the state of Ihram for Hajj, you don't have to go to Masjid Aisha. You can make it from the Masjid al-Haram itself or you can make it from your hotel room within Mecca also. So you can simply wear the ihram clothing in one's hotel room, proceed to the masjid, make the intention of the hajj with the talbiyah, just like you would do with the umrah, make the niyyah, recite the talbiyah, and now one is in the state of ihram for hajj. In hajj al there is no tawaf al -qudum. So your tawaf al technically was already done when you did your umrah. So there is no tawaf al -qudum. Tawaf al is done for those who do the hajj al which alhamdulillah I don't think anyone is doing over here. One will perform Fajr Salah in Mecca on the 8th. So you, you, you perform Fajr Salah on the 8th in Mecca. It is Sunnah to leave Mecca after sunrise. However, what people, people usually do is they, uh, they arrive in Mina at the time where they can perform Lohar Salah in Mina. So you, you arrive in Mina, you go to your tent, you settle in over there. Five Salahs are done in Mina on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah as well as the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. Lohar on the 8th, Asr on the 8th, Maghrib and Isha and Maghrib, Maghrib, which technically I guess becomes the ninth of Dhul Hijjah because of the, the sunset time changing. So Maghrib and Isha and then Fajr of the next day. These five salahs are performed in Mina. And on this day, when you perform these, there's not there's nothing special that's to be done in Mina. You just stay in your tent, you stay in that area, and just engage yourself in dhikr, engage yourself in Quranic recitation, engage yourself in dua. That's all that needs to be done at that particular time. Nothing else uh, special that's done on the eighth of Dhul Hijjah. Kind of a little map over here. Mecca to Mina. Then Mina you will go to Arafah, which is number four. Then Arafah you will go to Muzdalifa, and Muzdalifa back to Mina, and then back to Mecca. It's kind of like a circle type thing. Okay, reaching Mina. You'll see the signs all over where the boundaries are, but there'll be particular areas. You'll see the white tents all over. So now, when it comes to the aspect of being a musafir or a traveler, if one is staying in Mecca for a full 15 days plus without going to Medina or anywhere which is 48 miles or more outside that area, then they will be a muqim or they'll be considered a resident of that area. Most people do not stay that long in that area, so there you are considered a musafir for the entire period that you are there. So if you're praying by yourself in the tent or if you're praying in a jama'ah, with other people in the tent, if, as long as the imam is a musafir also, then you will also pray safar. If you are a muqim or a resident, then you will pray the full salah. So if the imam is leading as a musafir, you will stand up and you will continue. Or if one goes to the masjid in Mina and prays with the imam over there, then you will pray full with the imam over there as well. As we said, one should spend their day and night in worship, reciting Quran, engaging in dhikr, performing nawafil salah, making dua. It's, it's flexible for one on that particular day. So the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, this is a big day. This is a day that after the Fajr Salah, it's wajib now to start reciting. And this is for those who are the Hajjaj and for those who are the non Hajjaj as well. We know that after Fajr Salah, from this point all the way till the 13th of Dhul Hijjah Asr, to start reciting after every Farad Salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. The Takbir al-Tashriq will be recited after every Farad Salah. So this will begin on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah after Fajr and will end on Asr after the 13th, on the 13th. The Takbir will be recited after every prayer. One should perform the Fajr Salah on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah in Mina and then set off towards Arafah. So whenever your group is going towards Arafah, go and set off over there. It is now a wajib to perform the Wuquf, to station oneself in Arafah from the time of midday all the way until sunset. And this is the 
the beautiful scene, subhanAllah, which is reminiscent. Many of the scholars say that this is the scene which is most reminiscent of the Day of Judgment in this world and in this dunya. That you're standing on the hot plains of Arafah with the sun beating down upon you, wearing these two clothes, these two white sheets, which typically people are buried in the kafan, and you are crying your heart out before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleading for his forgiveness and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness. So this is a time to make as much dua as you can for yourself, for your family, for the ummah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay within the boundaries of Arafah when, when doing this. Okay, now this is a ruling that's actually in the Hanafi school of thought, that if one is performing salah with one's own group or individually, dhuhr and salah should be performed in their respective times. In the Hanafi school, even if one is a musafir, the ruling is that there is no jama'a bayna salatain in the sense that you pray two salahs in one time. The Hanafi school of thought, the, rule, the, the chosen ruling in the Hanafi school, even though even within the school there is different rulings itself, the chosen, when, when, they, when their interpretation of, of Jama'a Bayna Salatayn is that Dhuhr is done at the end of its time and Asr is done at the beginning of its time. So you combine the two in their respective times. However, in other schools, uh, like the Shafi school, for example, the ruling is that Jama'a Bayna Salatayn, you can pray Dhuhr and Asr in the Dhuhr time, for example, if you're a Musafir. So it is permissible uh, to do that. If one is near to Masjid Namira on that day, uh, one, perform, one can perform the Salat behind the Imam and one should do so. In this case, even if you're in the Hanafi school, the, there's a, the, the exception to this rule is that Dohar and Asr can be, will be combined with the Imam if one is praying only with the Imam of the large masjid on this day. This is the exception that's mentioned within the Hanafi school itself. So one should remain engaged in dhikr and dua in the plains of Arafah and the talbiyah should also be recited from time, time to time. Now you see a lot of people going towards jabal al rahmah or the Mount of Mercy in Arafah However, it's not necessary to be on it or to be near it. Some people think it's a necessity, I have to be on this mountain to make dua, but you'll see that it's so crowded over there. It's not, you, can, you can stand anywhere as long as you're in, within the area of Arafah and make dua. As we can see, climbing the mountain, offering salah on it is not established from the sunnah. It has no additional virtue. This is kind of a picture here. You can see all the white that typically on a day which is outside of Hajj, you'll just see the dirt and you'll see the mountain empty. But at the time when the Hajjaj are there, it literally becomes all white because of all the people standing there with their clothing. So it's wajib to stay in Arafah until the time of sunset. It's not permissible to depart Arafah before the time of sunset on the 9th. After sunset, one should leave immediately for Muzdalifah. And one does not pray Maghrib in Arafah. So yes, the sunset, you see the sunset in Arafah, but you do not pray your Maghrib Salah in Arafah. You depart to Muzdalifah, when you reach Muzdalifah, then you will combine the Maghrib and the Isha Salah in Muzdalifah, right? Maghrib will be performed with Isha in the Isha time in Muzdalifah. And this is regardless of, of any school of thought uh, that's, that's mentioned. So Maghrib and Isha will be performed in the following manner. And all these things, I'm pretty sure that there will be someone to help you and to guide you, you know, from whichever group package that you are in, they will give you the rules and the regulations. But Maghrib and Isha will be performed in the following manner. There will be one Adhan and one Iqama, followed by the Farad Salah of Maghrib, and then straight after the Farad Salah of Isha. Do not perform the Sunnah of Maghrib in between. The Sunnahs of Maghrib, Isha, and the Witr Salah that can be performed after the Isha prayer in order. So you do the Maghrib Salah Farad, then you will do the, the um, the Farad Salah of Isha, and then you can pray the Sunan and, and the, the Wajibat after that. So Muzdarifah is also a place where it's recommended now to collect the pebbles to pelt the Jamarat that you will need once you get back to Mina. After Muzdarifah, you will go back to Mina, you will need the pebbles to pelt the, uh, the, the pillars over there for the coming days. So it's permissible to collect pebbles from anywhere in the Haram precinct, but most of the people uh, take it from the area of Muzdalifah. Do not take the pebbles from the area around the Jamarat that have already been thrown by other people. So collect, while you're in Muzdalifah, you won't really have much else to do anyway. So collect the pebbles over there. And this is, you know, many of the scholars mention how this is one of the, the great miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that even though you have literally millions of people collecting a large number of pebbles at the same time, the pebbles are always there. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who, you know, restores these pebbles in some way, somehow that we do not understand. So alhamdulillah, you know, you would think that so many people collecting so many pebbles, they'll all go away. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who restores these pebbles in a way that, of course, we do not understand. So, it's per so one should not take the pebbles from around the Jamalat area where people are pelting. So the correct number, on the 10th on the of Dhul Hijjah, one will only need seven pebbles because only the large pillar will be stoned that day. However, the 11th, the 12th, and those who stay on the 13th, 21 pebbles will be needed. Seven for the large one, seven for the middle, and seven for the other one. I'm not sure what your package is, but I'm sure nowadays a lot of the packages will probably be leaving on the 12th, I'm, I'm guessing, the way that things are nowadays. And But if one is staying on the 13th as well, just make sure you collect the number of pebbles that are required uh, for the 13th as well. If you're going to leave Mina after pelting on the 12th, you will need a total of 49 pebbles. But if you're going to leave Mina after pelting on the 13th, then you will need a total of 70 pebbles. So take a little, you know, I would suggest to take a little Ziploc bag or a little drawstring bag and just collect these pebbles and put them in there, inshallah, and use those. And try to collect a few extra as well, you know, to be on the safe side. Okay. Wukuf in Muzdalifa. Even if one performs Maghrib and Isha Salah individually, he will combine them and perform the Sunnah and Witr after the Isha prayer. It is Sunnah to spend the night at Muzdalifa. So the night between the 9th and the 10th of, of Dhul Hijjah. Fajr Salah should be performed in the awwal time, in the beginning time in Muzdalifa. And then it is wajib to perform a wuku for a short moment between Fajr and sunrise. Meaning, you know, use that time to make some dua, make some adhkar after Fajr Salah on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah uh, in the morning. One should remain engaged in Salah, Dhikr, Dua, etc., etc. in that particular time. So before sunrise occurs, then one should leave Muzdalifa and they should head back towards Mina. So between the 10th and the 12th of Dhul Hijjah, there are four acts that need to be performed. And most of these, for most people, they perform all four of these actions on the 10th itself. There are some that delay, maybe the Tawaf is Ziyadah, for example, they'll delay it until the day after because to avoid the crowd. But at least for the first three, most people get that, you know, everyone gets that done on, on the 10th on the itself. So one is the pelting, which has to be done on each day. But again, the first day, it's only the the one uh, pillar that is that is pelted. After that is done, then you can see the aspect of the nahar, uh, the animal sacrifice, and then the halak or the, the trimming of the hair or the, the shaving of the head, and then the tawaf is ziyara. So the pelting is performed on all three days, the 10th, 11th, and the 12th. Again, the 10th will be the one, 11th and 12th, all three pillars will be pelted. Now, as far as the tartib, when it comes to the tartib aspect, the pelting of the tent for the one uh, pillar, and then the slaughtering of the animal, and the qasr or the shaving of the head, these three must be performed in sequence. So you can delay the tawaf until later on. That is fine. Even if a person does tawaf before doing the animal slaughtering, that is fine as well. But between the rami, for example, if you do the pelting, you can do the pelting, and then one is still in the state of the haram, then they can go to Mecca, they can do the tawaf al ziyara they can do the sa'i as well, and then they can come back, and then they can get their nahar or their animal slaughter done, and then they can do the shaving of the head, that's fine. But most people want to do these three first before tawaf, so that way they don't have to be in the state of ihram when they go back to Mecca for the tawaf al ziyara and for the sa'i. So Mina has three tall pillars known as the jamarat, the jamarat the aqaba or the kubra, the big pillar, the wusta, and the sugra. Again, the these were the places where when Ibrahim was given the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to slaughter Ismail alayhi salatu was salam and when he was on the way to the place where he was going to make the slaughter, the shaitan came in three different places and tried to convince him to change his mind. We know how difficult of a command that was, but the submission of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was so great that every time when he saw the shaitan in these places, he pelted him with stones. So th this is the place where we commemorate this great noble sacrifice of Ibrahim salam by doing this particular action. So we have to remember the pillars themselves, they're not, people call them, oh, this is the shaitan. It's not the shaitan itself, but rather it's just marking the place where the shaitan had come to try to convince Ibrahim salam to not proceed with the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So the Jamaat used to be one level way, way back many, many years ago, and now we've made it multiple levels and we've made it a lot easier for people so that way to avoid uh, large crowds. Because if you remember many, many years ago, there always used to be incidents of stampedes and other uh, you know, difficulties over there. Alhamdulillah, now with this system, they, they tend to avoid that. So this is kind of an overline of the Jamarat. You don't have to, you don't have to physically hit the pillar itself, as you see in the middle. As long as it gets within this whole bowl area, then it is valid for a person to, uh, it's a valid throw, I guess you can say. So the rami or the pelting is wajib. Men and women must pelt the pillars. It is a sunnah to say Allahu Akbar with each throw of the uh, stone. The recitation of the talbiyah, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, it will cease now with the end of the first throw. So you can, you can be reciting the talbiyah all the while up till, the, up till this time, but once you start that first throw, the talbiyah now is over. As long as the pebbles land within the enclosure, as I just mentioned, regardless of whether they hit the pillar or not, it counts as a valid throw. Do not stop to make dua at the big pillar after pelting, but keep on moving. It is a sunnah to use the right hand to pelt uh, the stone. And one should also throw the pebbles one at a time. Don't take all seven and just pelt and throw it. Take one at a time, say Allahu Akbar each time, and uh, do it in that particular manner. So on the 10th of the Hijjah, only the Jamara al-Aqaba, only the large pillar will be pelted. So you'll only need seven stones on that particular day. The times of pelting, before sunrise it is makru. And before sunrise anyway, you'll probably be in Muzdalifa still, so you don't have to worry about that. Between the time of sunrise and midday, that is the sunnah time to do it. If one wants to avoid the crowds, they can wait until the time between midday to sunset, and they can go and pelt at that time. It is permissible to do it uh, then. But if one waits between sunset to fajr of the next day, it is disliked. Most of the people do it between those two times, which are either sunnah or the permissible time uh, to get it done. Follow your group, I would say. That's my, that's my advice. Okay, we already mentioned this first point before. And we mentioned uh, the second point. The third point now, stop to make dua after pelting the smallest and the middle pillar. So after the first, after pelting the big one, which is the first one that comes up, do not stop and make dua over there. After you pelt on the 12th and third, on the 11th and 12th, when you're making, when, or the 13th if one stays, when you pelt the other two, you can stop there and make dua after pelting those. It is wajib to perform an animal sacrifice before the sunset of the 12th. Most people, of course, will get it done on the 10th itself, inshallah, by latest the 11th, but hopefully the 10th in the haram boundary. This sacrifice is known as dam shukr and is wajib upon those performing hajj tamattu or hajj al-diran. Now, most of the packages, I don't know if your cost includes this already or if you have to pay a separate fee over there. I guess you'll find out. Uh, I don't know what the details are with your packages, but the animal slaughter is usually arranged by the group itself. And you don't have to slaughter it yourself. They, they already have the arrangement uh, that is done for that. Okay, then halaq, again, as we had talked about in Umrah, it's also a wajib in this case, and the same ruling will apply for the females as applied in Umrah, the same ruling will apply for the males as would apply in the time of Umrah. And a person will now be free of the restrictions of ihram for hajj once this is done. So at, at the very least, you can say from the 8th, so the 8th, the 9th, and you can say for the 10th at least half the day. So at a minimum, you can say about two, slightly more than two full days or two and a half days altogether, you'll be in the state of ihram for hajj. And after that, you can be out of the state of ihram. So obviously it's a longer time being in the state of ihram for hajj versus being in the state of ihram for umrah, which is only a few hours, but at the minimum, about two and a half days or so, you will be in the state of ihram for, for hajj. So one will be free of restrictions. However, the prohibition of intimate relations with one's spouse, that remains imposed until the completion of the tawaf is ziyada. So even if one is out of that state of ihram, but they still have to perform the tawaf is ziyada, then uh, this, this particular prohibition will still apply. Tawaf is ziyada is a fara that must be performed between the 10th and the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. It is preferable to perform after the halaq or the, the shaving of the head. And until, as we already said this uh, last point, Every element of Hajj can be performed in one's uh, menses except for Tawaf, for Tawaf is Ziyara for women. 
So if a woman cannot perform tawaf of ziyara due to her haid, then there is no penalty for her delaying it, even if she does it after the 12th of Dhul Hijjah has passed. So even if the time uh, is delayed after that, she can go back and perform this tawaf of ziyara uh, after that, and there will be no penalty upon her. However, this is a tawaf again that must be done. Sa'i is also a wajib element of the Hajj. So the preferred time for the Sa'i is after the Tawab Ziyara. Once you perform your Tawab Ziyara, then you will go back to the Mas'a. So it's kind of like, I guess you can say, performing a second Umrah without being in the clothing of Ihram. As long as the other things were done before uh, doing so. So you would perform the Tawab, then you'd go to the Mas'a and you'd perform the Sa'i. So if a person performs the Sa'i after Tawab Ziyara, he will perform the Ramal in the first three rounds. Why? Because we, as we had said in the beginning, that Ramal, which is the brisk walk for males, but again, it's going to be very hard probably to do that because of the crowd over there. It's only if it is possible to do. Ramal is only done in those tawafs which, which, in which a Sa'i is followed uh, after it. The Sa'i can be performed in any of the Hajj days on condition that it follows a tawaf. So this is why most of the people do it after the Tawaf is Ziyada because they don't want to make separate trips again to go all the way back. So after the Tawaf is Ziyada is done, all the rules of Ihram are now uplifted and it is Sunnah now to go and to spend the night in Mina, which everyone typically does. Now on the 11th of Dhul Hijjah, whatever actions of the previous day have not been completed, one should try to complete them today. I think for most people, everything will be done inshallah on the 10th. It's very rare to see people delaying, um, unless, unless they delay the tawaf uh, on, on the 11th. But now, the only thing that's done on the 11th is the rami, or the pelting of all three of the pillars. So you have to go there, you prefer, uh, seven throws on the big one, seven throws on the middle, seven throws on the small one, um, and then... Yeah, so, so you can see, I guess, the, the, the order of pelting that comes is from the smallest to the largest, the way that, the way that it comes. So the time of pelting on the 11th and the 12th of Dhul Hijjah, uh, the Sunnah time is between Zawal or midday to sunset. It is permissible to perform the Rami after sunset until Fajr if it is not, if it is difficult to do so during the day because of crowds. Rami is also is not permissible before Zawal on the 11th and the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. So on the mornings of the 11th or the mornings of the 12th before the midday period, one cannot go and do the pelting on that day. We can only do it from the time of midday onwards. And then once one is done with that action, then you simply return to one's tent and just engage in any, any ibadah or any worship that you are able to do. Again, on the 12th of the Hijjah, the procedures are literally exactly the same. Now, if one does not leave Mina and stays there until the break of dawn on the 13th, then the Rami or the pelting becomes necessity to perform on the 13th of the Hijjah as well. So therefore, a person will have to then depart Mina after Zawal time on the 13th, perform the pelting, and then they are free to leave Mina after that. It is desirable and more virtuous to spend the extra night in Mina for the additional pelting on the 13th, but again, you follow your group and just follow what they do. The timings for Rami on the 13th is a little different than the 11th and the 12th. Between Fajr and Zawal, we know that for the 11th and 12th, it is not permissible to perform the pelting uh, in, in that time for those days. However, for the 13th, it is permissible, but it's still disliked. If one does it after Zawal, between sunset on the 13th, that is the recommended time even on that day. The time of pelting then ends with the sunset of the 13th. As you leave Mina, we see here that if uh, one does not intend to stay for the additional day, they must leave before sunset on the 12th of the Hijjah for Mecca. It is permissible still to leave after sunset, between the time of sunset and as subh sadiq but it is disliked, you need the time uh, before Fajr. You perform Salah in their respective times, wherever it may, wherever you may be. So now back to Mecca, the very last thing that is done is the tawaf i which is the farewell tawaf. And the farewell tawaf, the tawaf i it doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, I'm about to leave to the airport now, so I'm going to do it on that day. You can perform the tawaf i actually any time. You can even perform it when you get there. Even if you're going to stay in Mecca for a couple of more days, you can perform the tawaf i even then. That is a wajib. It can be performed any time after the tawaf is ziyah. If a woman is in her menses and cannot perform tawaf i she is completely excused from this tawaf. So unlike the tawaf is ziyah that she has to make up, the wafi 
if she if she is in her state of hayd, she is excused from that completely and there's no penalty upon her for missing that particular tawaf. So even after tawaf al wida a person can still enter the masjid, perform tawaf, salah, and even umrah. So it's not, there's this misconception that you have to do that tawaf on the last day, right before I leave and depart, but that's not the case, as, as uh, clearly mentioned by the scholars. Okay, we talk about the penalties. There are four types of penalties. There's the large penalty, the badana, which is the sacrifice of a large animal, either a camel or a cow. The dumb penalty, which is the sacrifice of a smaller animal, like the sheep or goat, typically the animal that is slaughtered at the time for qurbani or udhiyah. Then there's a sadaqah penalty, charity, which is just equal to the amount of sadaqah al-fitr, minor, minor penalty. And then there's a, a penalty less than the sadaqah al-fitr amount. So there's different actions which entail different types of penalties and the payments and the arrangement must be done in the precincts of the haram. So there are places in, over there, if you go in the clock tower, for example, there are particular locations where you can go to the person and you can tell them that I need to make I need to pay for this penalty. You give them the amount and they will arrange and make sure that it will be done for you in your name within the precincts of the haram and the precincts of the area. So they've made it a lot easier now to arrange uh, for this particular, uh, if any penalties need to be done. The badana penalty, which is the major penalty, will be binding by the following. Having relations with one's spouse after wukuf in Arafah and before the halaq. And before, be performing the tawaf of ziyara in the state of major impurity, that which necessitates, necessitates a fadl bath. So if, for example, if a woman was in the state of hayl and she must perform the tawaf of ziyara within those days that she's there because, say, for example, now the 12th comes up, the 13th comes up, and now she's departing back, departing to, back to the States or wherever on the 13th of Dhul-Hijjah. So as a very, very last thing on the 13th before departure, then make the tawaf at that time, even if one is in that state before departing. However, the badana, the large penalty, will become incumbent and necessary upon her in that particular case. The dumb penalty, which is the animal the size of the sheep or, sheep or the goat, if one is intimate with one's uh, spouse, yani in those other times that were mentioned, or a male wearing a normal clothing, besides the, the clothing of ihram, those which are prohibited, for the length of time which is an entire day or an entire night. Likewise, a half day or a half night, which equal one day, that will result in a dumb penalty. Also, shaving one fourth or more of the head, the hair on the head or beard, before one is supposed to do that, then in that case, that will result as a, a, in a dumb penalty. For a male or female to cover the face for the amount of an entire day, that also results in this penalty. Applying perfume to one, to one entire limb or one's clothing. Clipping all the nails of one's hand or foot, or one foot, so I guess you can say five, whether it's two, two fingers on one hand, three fingers on another, or whatever it may be, or two toes, three on another, or just all in general, that will also entail that. To omit the tawafi wida, this is for men particularly, um, and for women who are not in the state of hayd and they were able to do this. Then... Uh, if she was in the state of hayd, then she does not have to give any bum penalty. And also to admit any wajib action of hajj, as we had explained what the wajibat were before. And that will be, that is again listed in here when I give you this presentation. Sadaqah, which is again, just a penalty to give the amount of sadaqah of fitr. Just, you know, a few riyals, whatever it may be. If one shaves, cuts, or trims less than one-fourth of a head, so if one scratches their head and, you know, one strand, few strands of hair came out, then one must ensure to pay... Um, just the amount of sadaqat al-fitr to, and the best, the best place to give sadaqat al-fitr, in my opinion, is the workers of the haramain. Those people who are the cleaners of the haramain, they are the ones who, uh, they're, they're poor, they are ones who came from other countries, they're, they're serving themselves to clean the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they usually send money back to their family members, so they're the best people to give the sadaqat to, if one is able to do that. Plucking, trimming, or cutting three or more uh, hair strands. So I guess if it is less than three, uh, one or two hair strands, then it will be even less than that, just a little bit of sadaqah. But three or more hair strands, then you give the amount of sadaqah al-fitr. One or two nails, as we see, applying perfume to a little portion of the body, so less than one limb. For a male to wear normal clothing for a couple of hours, so for a shorter amount of time, then in that case, the sadaqah will be necessary. For males and females to cover the face for just a couple of hours. For a male to cover his head for a couple of hours, or to perform the wafi without wudu. 
and leaving one pebble out from the rami that will also entail giving some sadaqah so regardless of whether you feel you perform you did one of these actions or you didn't do one of these actions my recommendation is always just to give sadaqah anyway to the workers of the haram, of the, of the haram because it's not that much and alhamdulillah we all here can afford to give this sadaqah it will also be a means of inshallah protecting us from uh, committing any actions that may have been done that, that were done unintentionally that we may not even know of. So that's the best way to go about that. Less than a sadaqa amount, you know, these particular things over here. So hopefully we can at least give the amount of, uh, of, of sadaqa, of sadaqa al fitr. So alhamdulillah, at this point, the journey of the hajj has been uh, completed. The next thing, the next thing we talk about is the ziyarah of Prophet Asad bin Mashallah Nabawi. Now I know this aspect is something extra which is not and everything which is which happens in Hajj is in the Makkah area and around the Makkah area. The visitation of the Prophet Asad, of course, you go all the way to Makkah, you should make an effort to also go and visit the, the Madinat al and of course the grave of the Prophet. Very, very special place to be and um, you know a lot of virtues and fallah in when doing so. It's mentioned in various ahadith the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Ibn Khuzaymah. Now there is a weak, weak chain of narrations over here, but for the fadl and the virtue, this hadith is mentioned, my intercession is incumbent for he who visits my grave. Right. In Musnad Ahmad, however, with the reliable chain, the person who offers 40 prayers consecutively in my masjid without missing a prayer in between will secure immunity from the fire of Jahannam and free freedom from nifaq or freedom from hypocrisy or other punishments. But you know, unfortunately, most people don't have the time with their schedule to stay eight straight days in, in Medina, but this is one of the great benefits if one does that. However, there are other ulama who have mentioned that the visiting the grave of the Prophet is the greatest of the non-obligatory actions, uh, you know, because this is done out of the love for the Prophet So when you enter Medina al Manawara, focus and ponder on the sacrifices of the Prophet remember his favors and his du'as for the Ummah, Recite salawat upon the Prophet as much as possible because in, in Medina it's such that when a person is present in the presence of the Prophet or at least within the aspect of a person being shouting distance and a person can hear another person, when you recite salawat upon the Prophet he directly receives it and he directly responds to the salams of the people. When a person is far away, it's the angels who convey the, the salam to the Prophet as an intermediary on behalf of the person. But when you're in Medina, and you're within kind of that distance where you can even shout and hear another person, the Prophet himself receives it directly, and he responds to the salam of those who make salam to him. So that is one of the great blessings over there. So one should one should uh, take care of necessary arrangements, and it is mustahab, a recommendation to perform ghusl and wear one's best clothing. Before one sets off to visit the Prophet and say salam to him at his grave, just as you are about, just imagine, you're about to visit any important person in this world, any a uh, big time person over here, what are you gonna do? You're gonna make sure that you look your best and you dress your best. Who is greater than the Prophet ﷺ? There's absolutely no one who's greater. Look your best, put on some some ittar, you know, be in that state where you are, you're visiting Habibullah. And then those who are beloved, of course, the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the one who is also most beloved to us from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Give some wealth in sadaqah, you know, generally speaking, because this was also the habit of the Prophet ﷺ. So kind of a view of Medina over here. The, the, the side which is up is the back side of the masjid. Um, ladies' areas are in the back corners over there. Many of the hotels are in that back area as well. The dome area is in the very front, as you can see. That's the way facing Qibla. On that side of the masjid, you can see Al-Baqir, where many of the companions of the Prophet are buried, and some of the wives of the Prophet are also uh, buried there as well. So enter, of course, walk with humility into the masjid and, you know, you can recite any, even if you recite the dua of entering the masjid, Allah, like, tahriya ba wa that's fine. Try to pray to a salah in the masjid. Now the aspect of the rolda, again, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, system over there nowadays. Uh, you have to register your time. And with the way, the system that they have nowadays, you only get one shot. So you only get to schedule one time in the rolda, and after that, you won't get another chance because the system is that only after every, I think, 30 days or something, you can renew a permit for that. So make sure that you schedule a time. If you're, when you're going to Medina, make sure you know beforehand. And as soon as the slots open up, keep check, checking the Nusuk app and make sure you schedule your time for the Lola 
before that. And, and whoever's there guiding you at that time will give you the instructions in terms of how to, where to be, and how to interpret the Lola, and so on and so forth. So, speak, you know, this is a kind of an outline over here. You can see the top rectangular box uh, over here on the, on the very top. Uh, that's actually the grave of the Prophet wasallam. where you can see number four on the very, very top. That's the first hole in the in the um, in the Golden Gates, I guess you can say, this is directly aligned with the face of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whereas the the second hole is is um, directly aligned with the grave of Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu, and the third one is aligned with the grave of Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu taala an. Of course, they are buried in the home of Aisha radiyallahu taala anha. This is where the Prophet sallam passed away himself, and for the prophets, it's where they pass away. This is where they are buried. This is a rule that Allah subhanahu wa taala had for the Prophets and the messengers uh, of Allah. So, you know, when one visits the grave of the Prophet وسلم, try to be in that moment. You'll see a lot. You'll see everyone, um, you know, taking their phones and taking pictures and videoing and, and all that. Uh, you know, try to stay away from that out of respect to the Prophet وسلم, and then just be in the moment and make salam upon him, um, and then you know what we can in that particular way. So this is where we see, you see the the, large, the hole that has the larger gold piece around it, that is directly aligned with the face of the Prophet Sallallahu where he is buried, his face, of course, um, facing towards the direction of the Qibla, whereas the second hole is aligned with the face of Abu Bakr and the third one aligned with the, the face of Umar ibn Khattab So you, you know, people won't have time to stop and say salam in these different ways, but even if you say something like Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah, Assalamu alayka ya Nabi Allah, Assalamu alayka ya Habib Allah, it is fine to do that inshallah while you are making the salam. And you, and you know, when you're making salam to Abu Bakr as Siddiq as well, same thing, Assalamu alayka ya Abu Bakr as Siddiq, Assalamu alayka ya Umar ibn Khattab, you know, something simple as that, you can, you can do that inshallah. So there are just some diagrams about the, the blessed chamber. You can see it's very, very fortified and very protected. Um, because there were incidents in the in the past where, you know, where, where people from certain sects and, and whatnot they tried to attack these particular areas, you know, many many years ago. So they they, they made a, they protected these areas greatly. So the Rauda, as we had talked about, it's a very very special area that everyone longs to make salah in and, and make dua in. This is the area as mentioned, Sayyid al Bukhari, the area between my house and the house of Aisha, as well as the mimbar of the Prophet where he gave khutbah. It is a garden from the gardens of paradise. It's the, the, the roda. It's a garden from the gardens of paradise. What does this mean? Ibn Hajar he interpreted three meanings of this narration. Number one, the roda is like a garden of paradise in the sense that the constant mercy of Allah is descending upon this area, and whoever stays there is fortunate, just like the person who enters Jannah is fortunate. Secondly, worship in the Roda will eventually lead one to Jannah as this is a place that can, encourages one to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly, the physical area that is the Roda itself will actually be raised to the heavens and will be a physical part of Jannah itself. This is also one of the great interpretations of the scholars and Fatul Bari, for example. So all of these great benefits, it's a reason why everyone longs to pray in the Roda and to make dua in the Roda and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this secret space. You'll also see in that area next to the, in, in the Rolda area, there are eight different pillars which hold uh, a different type of significance. And the names of the pillars are labeled on each particular pillar. As you can see the different names that's mentioned over here. Again, these pillars are not to be kissed, hugged, or anything like that. However, one can perform salah and make dua next to these pillars. It is fine to do that. These are the types of pillars. You can see the names uh, mentioned, labeled in green over here. What are the significance of these pillars? Ustawana Hanana, the weeping pillar. This was the spot where the palm tree was, where the Prophet would lean on when delivering the Friday khutbah. And when, when um, it's mentioned that a weeping sound emitted from this tree when the Prophet started to use a pulpit. So when the mimbar was changed to a different location and a different pulpit itself that was built taller, so that any, the, the larger crowd and the people can see the Prophet the tree itself wept. This is something that, that they were the Prophet himself was able to hear because now the Prophet would not lean on this tree anymore when making khutbah. So the Prophet consoled the tree with his blessed hands and he calmed the tree down. 
Just imagine, subhanAllah. So this was the area where that tree uh, was located. Ustawari Aisha. This is the pillar that's mentioned in the hadith. There's one spot in this masjid such that if people knew the blessed nature thereof, they would cast lots just to pray there. This is uh, Ustawan, the, the pillar of Aisha radiallahu Ustawana Abu Lubaba, or at Tawbah. This was the pillar under which the companion Abu Lubaba tied himself to, to and the Prophet sallallahu untied him after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his repentance. So we don't want to go into the whole story about this particular aspect, but we can, inshallah, we'll talk about that at a different time. Ustawana Sarir. The Prophet sallallahu would make i'tikaf here and he would sleep here. So i'tikaf, of course, was done in the time of Ramadan. And he would he would make it and take off there, he would sleep there in the time of Ramadan as well. Mustawana Harsar Ali, this is the area of protection. So with some of the sahaba they used to sit there when keeping watch, or they would act as gatekeepers. Ali radiallahu anh would be one who would do this often, due to which it was known as Mustawana Ali. So while some of the Muslims were praying salah, some of the companions would stand their guard in case there was an ambush or an attack from the enemies of Islam while they were praying salah. And this was until the time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a particular verse stating that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the one who will protect them. So there's no need for them to uh, do this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them while they are in that state. Ustawana Mufud, this means delegations. Whenever a delegation would arrive to Medina, they would meet at this place where the Prophet used to come out and he used to meet them at this pillar. He would converse with them and he would teach them about Islam. Then Ustawana Tahajjud is the place where the Prophet a carpet was laid out for him late night and he would perform the Hajjad Salah after the people had left and departed the masjid. And Ustawana Jibreel, this was where Jibreel used to enter to visit the Prophet wasallam, whether it was for Wahi or anything else. And today it cannot be seen as it lies inside the sacred chamber, uh, getting inside the home of Aisha radiallahu So while in Medina, spend as much time in the masjid as you can with the intention of i'tikaf, Remember the reward for salah in a single good deed is multiplied by a thousand times in uh, in Medina, as mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, while we know in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, multiplied by 100,000 times. Try to perform as many sal salawat as you can, of course, now with the roda, with the restrictions, we, we know that, but only go one time. But recite as much salawat as possible, have respect for the city of Medina and the people of Medina, give salawat to the needy people of Medina as well, just as the Prophet used to do. So Jannat al-Baqi is the famous graveyard of al Madina. As we know, it is right next to the masjid. So it's right next to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the, on the, on the, uh, if you're facing towards the Qibla, it is on the left side of the masjid. This is a graveyard that contains numerous uh, sahaba and pious predecessors, the wives of the Prophet as well, and others, some of the wives of the Prophet um, what should visit this graveyard? There are certain times of the day that it is open. You can go there, you can walk inside, you can make dua for the inhabitants of the graveyard as well. Another place to visit in, in uh, Medina is Masjid al-Quba. It's the first established masjid when the hijrah was being made. Before the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, he established the Masjid in Quba. This was the first masjid ever established in the history of Islam. Right? So he used to go there every Saturday, either walking or by riding. And now, alhamdulillah, there is a pathway that, that they built directly that goes from Masjid al Nabawi to Masjid al Quba, direct path. You can walk that path. It takes about 40, 40, about 45 minutes or so to walk that path. It's aligned with you know shops and cafes and other things like that as well. So it's a, it's a nice walk. It, they they kind of they've kind of tried to make it like a mini version of uh, if you've been to Istanbul and gone to that uh, Istiklal Street or whatever. They kind of try to make it like a mini version of that. So um, it's a good way to go and fulfill the sunnah walking. What about al Quba? We know the hadith of Prophet that whoever goes to this masjid and prays therein will have the reward like that of an Umrah. And another hadith mentions that one should make their, their wudu at home or in their hotel before proceeding to Masjid al Quba, then proceed to the Quba and pray the Turaqah of Salah, and that reward will be there. Picture of Masjid al Quba. And even with Masjid al Quba now, they're also doing a, a huge expansion of Masjid al Quba, so you'll see a great um, amount of construction going on. Even in Masjid al Nabwi itself, on the side, of Jannat al-Baqi, or of al-Baqi, behind it, there's also an expansion project going on over there. They'll be expanding uh, on that side to fit uh, even more, more pilgrims. When one leaves Medina, they should perform two rakat uh, of salah, and then proceed again to say salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa before uh, one leaves and departs Medina. 
And that is the end. There are of course other places to see in Medina as well that you can go to. If you, if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have any particular ziyara planned, there's also the red buses that they have, the hop on, hop off buses to uh, visiting Medina. They stop off at all various holy sites. So you can go to uh, you can go to Uhud and see the site of Uhud. Go to Quba, uh, Al Qiblatain, Sabah Masajid, where the Battle of Khandaq took place. You know, these different areas that they stop, hop on, hop off, you can go and you can see these particular sites that have um, a significance to them. So, I know there's so much, but this is literally, you know, everything I guess you can say in a nutshell in the most simple way possible. And again, I will send um, this presentation to all of you in PDF form. You can look over it. And if anyone has any questions while they are there, even before they go there, you can inshallah send us um, questions on our WhatsApp group that we will make. There's also a guide over here in paper, very, very small guide with small print, but if you have like all the all the rules and regulations on, on a front and back sheet, this is it right here. It's mentioned. So you have that, you'll have the PDF access over here and all of that. So any questions we can take inshallah, yes? So, so I'll group my questions in two sections. So the first question is about Ihram. I heard that, that it's Nia and Tafiyah, but why in the state of Iran we're wearing the two uh, pieces of cloth they get impure, you're allowed to wash them or change your piece of clothing? Yes, so if they get impure, you can wash it, you can wash the clothing, or if you have a, if you have a spare pair of ihram, you can take it off and you can change into a, another pair of ihram. And for sleeping, I saw that in the Sadaqah section, so do you still prefer to sleep in those cloths, or you can sleep in... Regular? Yeah, so you can sleep, yeah, so even sleep, as long as you're in the state of ihram, you have to remain in those clothings. Um, you can cover yourself in a blanket as well. That's fine. Just make sure you don't cover your face for a prolonged period of time. Otherwise, the major penalty will be due. But if you if you cover your face even for a short period of time, you just have to give some sadaqah and it will fulfill that requirement. Right, second sure. question. Mm -hmm. So the concept of Eid, mm -hmm. uh, so 10th of Hajj, yes. so is, is there a khutbah that day? And then... No, so for the it's different for the Hajjaj. For the Hajjaj, there is no Eid khutbah. And there is no, there is no uh, other sacrifice that has to be done either. The, the, the only sacrifice that's done is the sacrifice of your Hajj animal. Uh, there is no khutbah, there is no eight salah for the Hajjaj. It's different for the Hajjaj versus those who are the non pilgrims. And then 11 salah is Juma. So we'll just have regular Juma salah there. Um, so, so if you're in Mina, if you're in Mina, it's actually, unless you go to. I don't even know if they'll, they'll do the Juma actually at Masjid Namira. It's no, it is not a requirement. There, there will not be a Juma Salah. Now, if they, if they do like a smaller gathering of Juma, maybe they'll do something like that. Then you can join that. There's no problem. But if you don't do Juma, you just do Bukhar because you'll be considered a Musafir anyway. It is permissible to do that. Another, another actually point that you remind me of, Jazakallah, for reminding me, is that on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Arafah, we know that. Typically speaking, the hadith of Prophet mentions about fasting on the day and the reward of fasting on that day. But this is only for those, the fasting aspect is only for those who are the non hujjaj For those who are the hujjaj as evidenced by when the Prophet made his hajj, he did not fast on the ninth of the hijjah. So the hujjaj when you're there on the ninth, you do not fast. This is, this is only for those who are the non hujjaj who are not uh, there on that particular day. Okay, I'll just put one more on this side and then we'll go on this side, inshallah. Yes. Yeah, uh, in total we will be doing three umrahs. First, first sure. umrah will be in uh, Haram and other two will be in Naran so You'll be doing three umrahs? Yeah, one, yeah. So, no, no, so, well, you get there, you do your first umrah, yes. that you're in Ihram, right. you get out of the state of, you get out of the state of Ihram. Now, are you going to be doing a second umrah before the days of Hajj start or no? No, 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 yeah, so, so that's not, that technically the Dwab is Ziyara and that's Sa'i, that's not Umrah, okay, okay. that's part of Hajj, but the steps of that Umrah and the steps of that Sa'i are basically similar to that of, of the Umrah, like the, like the Istiqbal, Istilam, and all of that, it's, it's similar to that particular aspect, right, so, yes? Is the animal that you slaughter on the uh, day of... Uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the 10th, yes. Is, is that sufficient also for Udhiyah, so you don't have any to slaughter? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So you don't have to. You don't have to slaughter a second animal. Okay. So for the hajjaj, only the one animal is fine. Sure. Yes. Correct. So in all the tawabs, we have to keep the right shoulder open. Uh, so 
anytime that only if you're wearing the clothing of ihram, only when you're wearing the clothing of ihram, and there's a sa'i that follows that, then you uncover your shoulder. On the 10th of, of uh, Al-Hijjah, when you're making the tawaf al ziyarah most likely you'll already have your, your um, slaughtering of the animal and your halaq already done. In that case, you'll be out of the state of Ihram. So you can actually take a shower there in Mina, you can change into your regular clothing, and you can make the tawaf over there. So when you're wearing your regular clothing, then you don't have, then there's no uncovering of shoulder in your regular clothing. But if you're still in this, uh, the, uh, wearing the ihram, so do you have a new... If you're wearing, if you're wearing your ihram, but, but if you've done those other conditions where you're not in the state of ihram, you don't have to uncover your shoulder. Yes. It's only if you haven't done the, the, the slaughtering of your animal yet, or the, you know, if, if that, and you're still in the state of ihram, then in that case, you, you, you can uncover your shoulder, yes. So you mentioned, like, you should be in the state of ihram before, uh, prior to the 8th of Dulhaj. So that means before the Maghrib on uh, I mean, it's just recommendation, but most people will do it on the 8th itself. Before you before you proceed to Mina on the eighth. That means after so after Fajr, Fajr, yes, correct. After Fajr on the eighth, anytime then get into the state of the harm at that time. Correct. Yes. So the Jama of Dhuhr and Asr mm -hmm. and Arafah and the Maghrib and Asha in Muzdalifa, is that for all Hijaz? Like for example, I'll be there for eighteen days, so that's beyond the time of uh, So okay, so you'll be there for you'll be in that Mecca area, you'll be in there for a full eighteen days. Yeah. Yeah, so so you'll be so the aspect of the combining salah in um, in Arafah and Muzdalifah in Arafah, if you you know you pray with the as long as you pray with the Imam in Arafah in the large masjid, then you will do the combination. And in Muzdalifah, yes, you will do the combination. But besides that, besides that, then you will pray full salah. If you that's again, if you're praying, um, you know, well, it will be full salah regardless. Even if you're praying like in a small jama'ah with your group, and if somebody's a mustafir, you will stand up and you will. And you will make up the other rakahs because 15 over 15 days, then you'll be established as a technical muqim of the area, like a resident, I guess you can say. Yes. Another example, mm -hmm. you said that the belt will be fine. How about the backpack? Yes, backpacks. Backpacks are also permissible. Drawstring bags, backpacks, that's also permissible. Yes. So if he's going to Medina and coming back again, so will he be? So yeah, if you're between the 18 days, if you are going to Medina and if you're coming back, then you'd be considered a musafir. But I don't know if you're. Are you doing that or no? No. Eighteen, 18 days. full days. Yeah, so if you're eighteen full days over there, you'll be considered a resident over there. Right. So wudu is mandatory only for the tawaf, other than salah, right? Correct. For stoning also, we don't require wudu. No. Okay. no. Yes. Um, I mean, um, the sacrifice before uh, we, we, we may not be knowing whether the sacrifice is already done. It's being done by somebody. So else. they. So so whoever's in charge of your group, they're the ones who have to inform you about that. So we should make sure that... Yeah, you, you have to make sure, you have to, yes, so, so whoever is in charge of that group, they will, typically what they do is they inform you, they inform the group, okay, all your slaughterings are now confirmed, they're done. So you know, you know now that, okay, you can proceed to the step of doing the, the, the halaq of the air. So just confirm with whoever the leader is, make sure that it's done, and then and only then do the next step. That's very important. Yes, sister. Mm -hmm. Correct. So as long as one is in the state of ihram, then any perfume, anything that's scented, cannot be worn. Unscented soap, unscented deodorant, as long as it's, it does not have a scent, you can wear that. That's fine. Yes. Oh, yeah. Any other sisters have questions? Yes. yes. Excuse me. You said uh, there is just one time, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, right. for istiqbal. Allah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, yes. So if someone do it seven times, does it affect on... Uh, it doesn't affect it. It doesn't affect it. I mean, oh, yeah. you only have to do... Is, well, istiqbal is only done one time. And then istilam is bismillah Allah Akbar. That's done eight times. So from the time you start, one round is done. That's the second time. Second round is done. That's the third time you do it. So by the time you finish seven, seven rounds, eight times in total, you will do istilam. Bismillah Allah Akbar. Bismillah Allah Akbar. Right. If you say Allah Akbar, that's fine. It's not going yes. to break anything or anything like that. But, if, if you don't shave, if, if you turn them in... Yes. And then you, after Hajj, uh, mm -hmm. you, you determine not to, to shave. Yeah, it's, it's acceptable. It, it, will, it will still fulfill the requirement. It's superior for men to shave, to shave it off. But if you, if you just cut, then it will, it will still fulfill the requirement. No, no, no.
while doing tawaf, uh, we should not face uh, towards the Kaaba? Yeah, like, right. If you do, if you face towards the Kaaba while doing tawaf, yes. Perform dumb. The, 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 there is no dumb. There is no dumb for that. I mean, there are scholars who give that recommendation. You know, one should, you should just face the direction that you are going. I mean, then you face. Only, yeah, only, only when you're making the indication yeah. towards the the black stone, then you should face towards it. Um, but if one does it, there's no there's no penalty or anything like that. So nothing, nothing you know, nothing wrong with that. Many times, you know, you're just gonna glance. At least with your face, you're gonna look and glance towards the Kaaba. You know, just <laughs> because it's it's over there, but. There's no penalty or anything like that. In the yes. haram time, uh, if someone used the comb and there's hair, uh, yes. is there a penalty for that? So yeah, we had mentioned that if it's uh, one or two strands of hair that come out, then less than the sadaqa, just a few reals, that will be due. If it's more than three strands of hair, uh, up to one-fourth of the head, then sadaqa al-fitr. If it's more than one-fourth of the head amount, which <laughs> is probably unlikely, then the penalty will be due upon the person. No, so hujaj they, they do not they they must not fast. Yes, hujaj must not fast because the, the Prophet himself he would fast on the day of Arafah every year, but when he performed the Hajj, he did not fast. He actually showed as an example that a hujaj who are who are there that they don't fast on that day because they're already engaged in you know all this other ibadat on that day to not make it you know difficult on themselves. Because of the heat of that day as well. Yes. So, so some packages that doesn't include any uh, visiting from Medina. It's only a yeah. So if if it doesn't if it doesn't include that, then you would have to you would have to try to make the arrangement on your own some way. Um, I mean, it, again, it, when you're performing that, it's not technically it's not a requirement to go to Medina, but you go all the way there to Mecca. You know, you at least want to. Now, worst worst case, if you absolutely only have like a few hours even, if you have one day or a few hours, half a day. With the train system nowadays, if you book the, the Haramein railway train, it takes two, about two hours, 15 minutes, two hours, 20 minutes to go from, from Mecca to Medina. You can book the train, you can take the train to Medina, you can go to the masjid, you can make salam to the Prophet you can free salah over there, and then you can take the train back in a few hours. If one has to, one uh, I, I has to do that. another question that should, should be asked, but uh, how far is this the, uh, the station of the train from the Masjid of Nawaz? It's uh, so if you take if you take the car, if you take a taxi or something like that, it's maybe about it's probably about twenty minutes, twenty twenty five. It's not bad. It's not too bad, okay, so but twenty not, minute drive. It's not too far. No, it's actually closer to the Masjid than the airport is closer. The, the Medina Airport. It's about 20 minutes. Even the Makkah station is not too far. It's, that's also about 20, 25, 25 minutes or so. It's not easy to get booking now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're going to increase the amount of trains also going in Hajj season. So if yeah. you can get, download the app, the HHR, the High Speed Harmain Railway, the app, and it's a lot easier to navigate on the app and to look over there for that shop. I know most of like COVID restrictions are uplifted, but if you want to like just be extra careful and wear a mask, is that? Yeah, that's a good question actually. So if you wear the mask and you and you cover uh, your face, then you will have to give just a sadaqa penalty, not a not a dumb penalty. I see. Yeah. And then covering the head, if you have the habit of keeping your glasses off, is that? Also that's not no, that 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 doesn't that's not included in covering the head. Right. Sure. Is salam be do, done by two hands or one hand? Either, either way, it's not even even putting up the hand technically is not, you know, just it's just kind of indication. But one hand or two hands is fine. It's fine. Inshallah. Anyway, yes, but... um, my stopover is in Cairo. So uh, sorry, a stopover uh, uh -huh. is in Cairo, Egypt. Oh, Cairo. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, the two rakat sunnah, can I pray there or should it be uh, during? You can. So you can pray the two rakat salah over there, okay. and then you can wait to make the intention in Talbiya. While you're on the plane, okay. yes. Should I be doing in the plane as well to rakat if possible? No, you, you don't have to. If you do the Torah salah there, then you don't have to. Okay. Yeah, you can make, you can wait to make the actual intention then on the plane itself before you enter the the miqat. Yes. Yeah. So, when I'm talking about Musaf, you said the uh, 15 days, right? For example, if it's like 17 days, Musaf and Musaf, including Musaf, yes. Yeah. No, no. So if you, so, say for example, you. You have say for example you're there for 17 days 
eight days you're in Mecca. You go to Medina now for a couple of days. Now you come back. You'll be a Musafir the whole time because of the fact that you left the boundaries of Mecca in between. It's the, it's the aspect of being in one location or one area, 15 days or more. So say, for example, you're in Mecca. Now, you haven't gone past the boundary of being a Musafir. So what we say, 48 miles or more. In all these places, whether it's Arafah, Muzdalifah, um, you know, Mina, all these places that you have to be for Hajj, it's not 48 miles outside, outside Mecca. So if you're in that whole same area for 15 days or more without going to Medina, then you would be considered as a Muqim or a resident. How the situation would be handled if someone realizes that he had a jump penalty and by the time he realized he had already left Makkah Medina was probably here? No, I mean, if someone has realized that afterwards, then they need to make the arrangement for it to be done in the Haram area. Okay. So. Yeah, now I think there are websites even nowadays where that you can do that. Uh, so yeah, even if one did not do it over there because they did not know, and then they found out later on, then you make the arrangement. But again, the, the arrangement has to be done within the Haram area. You cannot, for example, say that, okay, I'm going to get an animal slaughtered in India or Pakistan or you know, anything like that. You have to get the arrangement done in the Haram precinct itself. Thank you. No problem, inshallah. All right, alhamdulillah. Oh, yes. Correct, yes. As long as anything is not scented, then you can you can wear that. And it will not be us. Excuse me. If someone take the train and uh, go to Al Medina and visit the Al Masjid al Nabawi but and stay right there, uh, Salat Dhuhr, Salat Asr, but he couldn't visit Al Rawda, uh, the Prophet's grave. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? No 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 the, the, the Prophet's grave and Bolda are different. Now there there are the Prophet Sassam's grave is always accessible, however now there are different there are different timings for men and women. Now, I don't even know about, about the women's aspect, if they open up that particular area where you can go right next to the grave, but the Rolda area, um, it's different for, they have timings for, for women and they have timings for men. So you have to see, you have to see on the app, on the Nusuk app, yes. and see the timings that are There's available for men and women. Yeah. There's a schedule and you have to book that particular aspect. So. Um, or otherwise, for, for the men at least, uh, the salam to the Prophet salam is always accessible. You don't need an appointment for that. You can always go in the in that area at Baba Salam and make the salam. So inshallah, uh, jazakallah khair to everyone. Um, you know, I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts all of your journeys. May Allah accept your hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep all of you safe, keep all of you healthy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a means of Forgiveness for all of you. I hope you all make dua for us as a community as well and for the ummah in general. And, you know, any again, anything we can do to serve you and anything we can do to help you, we're here at your service, inshallah. Anything we can do to answer questions, I'm, I'm here to answer questions. Shaykh Hamza will be glad to answer questions. All of our ulama will be happy to do that. We're going to make that group, inshallah, for all of those who are the hujjaj this year. You can send your questions while you are there or even before there. We'll be more than happy to answer and whatever we can do to, at your service, inshallah. We will do that. How do you sign up for that group? Uh, I think we'll we'll make a group inshallah. So I in, in that group right now that's mentioned, the Umran Hajj group on WhatsApp. Are, are you on that other group, the general one? I'm on that. I'm not on that. Group, group, like, not the... Oh okay, yeah. There's that. There's some group right, right that's on right now. But uh, what we will do is we'll make a separate group from that, just for the Hajjaj who are actually traveling this year for a question and answer thing, a service. We had the service last year as well. We're gonna do it again this year. So what what I'll do is. Um, we will inshallah post on uh, on some of the other groups that people are on. I can invite to that group and whoever wants to join, they can join Is that, that group. Is that like group organized people going like to hash through the mosque or like uh, because I'm going independent? Is that... No, 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 no. So, so this is just a general group that, you know, those who, those, it was questions about the whole process of booking and, you know, tips that people were giving each other and things like that. It was more, it was more about that particular aspect. Yeah. So before you leave, again, uh, we have the drawstring bags in the box. Those who are going, you know, brothers and sisters, please take one each. Uh, the, the brothers, please take an ihram, inshallah. Uh, go, feel free to take that. There's miswaks in this. Feel free to take however many, you know, your number of miswaks you need. That's in that drawstring bag over there. Also, please take uh, the sheet with you, inshallah. This is like a little 
pocket guide, I guess you can say, that you can keep with you. And again, I will send this uh, PDF of this presentation out to you so that you have it at your disposal. And any questions you have, I'll be more than happy to answer, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from each and every one of you. SubhanAllah, we're going to be smarter for Muhammad. Ashhadu Allah, we're going to be smarter for Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, yeah.